code in the matrix it's how we play algorithms crafting the future our way silicon visions from dusk till dawn we're the wizards of tech where progress is born with every line we're defining the time creating a world where the virtual climb Ponies and bubble gum floating around. Tech a cord who's bored the calculus of IT with Nate and Mike drown in the nether or just escape to Neverland. Do this with their group set up. Sure, sure. All good things. So supposedly here at seven thirty, there's gonna be a big comedy act. Yeah, so I read, that's why I read on the door. It's. I wondered, do they think they meant us? Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought maybe they knew we were coming. Did someone get get like a word out that we were. That's gonna be us. We were here. I thought that was for sure what it was actually. It's like, did you call ahead? Let everyone know. Okay. Right, hold on, I'm gonna turn off the shading for this because I. So we were driving home the other night, listening to the. The theme song again. A lot of laughs. Classic. Oh, yeah, dude. Classic. I made one more rap thing, but it didn't come out too good. But hey, what are you going to do? Nothing you can do about that. I think, uh... <laughs> Whoa. What? All right, hold on a second. All the things. So here at the Common Craft... In Burlington, you can go. I thought we were at Bennigan's. Or at Bennigan's, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, we had, it was 99. Or, or Denny's. Was Denny's? We're at Friendly's right now? We're at Friendly's. Friendly's added pleather couches to its. Um, to yeah. its, to its uh, cheers, man. Yeah, cheers. Good to see you. I have some uh, McLighty. I went McLighty tonight. I need to be on a good behavior. You're going to whip? What? McLighty. I should have water. Because this is uh, 3.2% alcohol. It's like a few eye drops, eye droppers in the uh, in the drink. You, you can, you just can take, a hint of cheese. You can, take this, you can take the same stuff that you, the visine, you put in your eyes and just drink that. And then oh. you do the same. Or like uh, drink drink toothpaste. What if you drink visine? What happens? Any ideas? Well, what is visine? Just wa salt water, right? Yeah, it's like saline and a little bit of... Medicine, we as we like to call it. What and, uh, happens know, everywhere if you drink Visine? What's Gemini say? It contains tetrahydrosoline that can have serious health implications if ingested. Don't ingest Visine. It can lead to lethargy, that would explain hypertension, a lot. bradycardia, and respiratory depression. Wow! So and all those things. So that was a good test. Don't actually drink a yeah, Do not do that. That's bad. Uh, do you accidentally get drops in your mouth? McLeity is not. Immediately call Poison Control Hotline. Yes. 1-800-222-1222. Public service announcement. And they will tell you to stick your fingers down your throat. <laughs> and drink McLeity. A lot of McLeity. it. McLeity. McLeity. There's something about McLeity. There's man. a there's a one so good right now. There's a one star extension which will give you dark mode in Google Docs. Yeah, everybody <laughs> that's installed it is like piece of shit. So, so I'm tempted to install it just to see how. I thought bad you it. could do it. I thought it was built in now. You cannot do yeah on, on iOS and Android on the uh, well, the talk, web machine that they just talked about it in uh, 
in at uh, I/O. No, it's uh, you're in Google Docs. Yes, there's no. Um, you have to make the whole thing like what I did. You 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 just turn the page black, and I made the text white because it's always reflecting in my glasses when I'm reading. Oh, I see. So I'm trying to make it not because I'm hip, even though I am tragically hip. You know what you need? I think I have a way to do it. Let's talk about it for a second. Hold on a second. Watch this. Let's see if it works. Just on my my machine. So uh, you did send me that one nice announcement, by the way, from uh, I.O., which we'll, we can play in a moment. Yes. It was a wonderful, it, you know, this small thing on AI. It summed up the keynote in 45 seconds. Yep. Yes. I like that. What is it you're doing now? I'm just, I'm just seeing if this works. It would blow my mind if it does. Why don't you, why don't you use an island, Mike? I can't use island. That's why I need, I need to use this. There it is. Is it off? Okay. Dang. Now I can't see the text because it's black. Yeah, that's Safari. I know. Oh, I'm not using Safari. Well, I'm just trying to, I'm just Listen, trying to help you out. The way here. I, the way I did it is just fine. Look, I can't even see it. And I can't see any text anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to the Cognitive of IT Podcast. Oh, right. oh, welcome. We're welcome to the, the Cognitive Load. We're loading right now cognitively on on mole tops and and ponies. No sad salad tonight, unfortunately. This is, no, this is the home of the sad salad. Did you eat anything? Not yet. Oh, we're getting crazy tonight. So, it's the home of just that is zero. And the official home of the Tech Accord. And I, I, I got a note from one of our fans today yeah. that we are basically the only reliable source of information on the internet. Really? So what, what we said it last week, and so now it's become manifest in, wow. terms, of, in terms of truth. We've hashtag, gone viral. Hashtag truth. We are the source of truth. We are the source of truth. That's so good to hear. If you need truth, you come to the right place. Here's the truthness of things. Uh, also, it's the nexus of the nether. Nexus of the Neverland, um, and tonight we are going to get AI AF. Watch out! Watch out! Man. We, have, we got a big opener on AI. Absolutely. I'm Nate McBride. This is Michael Crispin. Hello, hello. Good to see you again. And we are your digital custodians for this, the 24th episode of the Calculus of IT podcast. It's totally Where are we tonight? TGI Fridays. We're at TGI Fridays right now. Chuck E. Cheese? I was checking our audio, and making sure we're okay. That's the cognitive load effect. Yeah, it's like we, an echo. We listen to ourselves echo. while we're talking to ourselves. Is it, hello, hello, anyone here? Um, I'm being quiet now. You sound good. Do I sound good, being quiet? You sound hot, you sound hot. So if you weren't able to make the, attend the Google keynote today for IO, um, they did a wonderful summary of the keynote. Do you want to go ahead and play it? What, 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 the play, what, you want to play the keynote? Sorry. Okay. I got to I gotta get it. Let me pull it up. I'll queue it up. Yeah, so you sent it to me in, on Discord. Discord. I don't want everyone to see this, all this stuff in here. Let's see what happens. It's right there. Tech Accord. It'll play through, right? Yeah, I'm going to share the screen here once I can get it pulled up. Um, Let's see how we do this. <laughs> All right. Hold on a minute. I like technology. And it smells like bubble gum. It does. It, it does kind of smell like bubble gum. It does show it? Or what's that? Is it showing it? I can't no. see. No, not yet. Well, you always play the audio, right? No, I won't play the audio. I didn't know I was going to be sharing uh, digital information tonight. You can't send me something that's so pivotal to Google's future <laughs> and then not expect me to want to share it. With oh, yes. I know. I didn't know we were going to um, we were going to share the uh, share the screen. Mike, right? just play the fucking audio, Mike. You can't hear it. Don't really hear it. Well, you could, you're clicking everything but the thing you should be clicking. Click that thing right there. Which thing? You go back over that. You know, the little the little gear. Mouse over that. The little gear right there. Oh, no, right there. Yep. 
Oh, that's not it. Yeah, see, it's right here. So we just got to go and pick the right thing. It's right there. Are you at? Yeah. It's in full screen. It's like watching Joe Lewis use a mouse. Yeah. You have, you're all over the place. I am. I'm trying to do this on the fly. Okay, while you're doing that, I'm going to have some. Do you have a beer? <laughs> Loving it. I'm just trying to pull it up in a browser window. Because it doesn't, it's not like a YouTube video. Well, just co yeah, but just copy this link. Here it is. Here it is. I did. That is the link, Nate. It's the same thing. Up in the UR br the browser bar. It is the URL. You're, you're looking at the screen. Yeah. yeah I'm just so people to, can see the screen? I'm just trying to share it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here it is. They won't be able to hear it. It's okay. Why, why can't they hear it? Because you get a microphone on. No, but they can hear it through. No. Then what's the point of playing it? Just stop playing it. But I want. I wanted to see if it would go through. No, it won't. That was cool. We tried. We will post the link later. Yes. <laughs> we got to practice sharing links in real time with audio. I didn't it's know we were doing that. It's very complicated, apparently. It, it totally is. When you're trying to go live, but we'll, we'll figure it out. If you want to deep dive into this thrilling competition right now, you can join us on Discord and tell us how much we suck at our technical skills. Yes, um, we do suck. Between us, only a combined 50 <laughs> years of IT. Uh, you can find the link to our Discord server as usual in the show notes. So come by and share your innermost thoughts and feelings. Um, you can also find the Discord link at our website, the coit.us. I just posted a link for everyone to watch. I want to also mention that if you like our show, please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube or wherever the hell you listen to the show. If you listen to it on Netflix, then give it a thumbs up on Netflix. In our show description, we have links to our Bias of Beer portal and our new merch store, tonight. which is growing as we speak. It grows every week. Um, also, like I said, if you want to buy us a beer, it's pretty easy. You just go to that little link. You can click buy us a single beer or 100 beers if you're feeling generous. Uh, beer money doesn't really go to the show. It goes to us by beer. So I don't want to be I want to be clear about that. Like I'm not using the money and I'm saving it all up so I can buy a new <laughs> microphone. I'm literally going right out and buying Still get a, a beer. beer. Oh, I get it. In a brown bag. That's what we have to do. Uh, quick word from our sponsor. Are you an IT professional looking to elevate your leadership skills and advance your career? I of am. Of course. Who isn't? I am. Discover Luminaries Forge, the pinnacle of IT leadership development. Our nine-month intensive program is meticulously crafted to transform tech-savvy individuals into visionary IT leaders. At Luminaries Forge, we offer a unique, personalized training experience in small, exclusive cohorts limited to 10 future luminaries. This ensures focused attention, enhanced interaction, and a curriculum tailored to your needs. With us, you're not just another face in the crowd, you're an integral part of a tight knit professional network that will support your growth long after the program ends. Our innovative approach is practical, empowering, and designed for immediate application. With real world exercises and mentorship from industry experts, we require not just knowledge, but actionable strategies that you can implement the very next day. We're not just about teaching either, we're also about achieving. Every session promises an outcome that enhances your capability and boosts your confidence. Join Luminaries Forge and become the IT leader you're destined to be. Forge ahead with us and turn your potential into impactful success. Visit www.luminariesforge.com today to embark on your journey. And let me mention, I finished my MIT class. Oh, I know. It cost 30 grand about three weeks ago. How'd it go? And crickets. Crickets. What do you mean? There's no follow-up. There's no... Uh, now that they have your money, they're not going to... you have their money, and they you don't get, want to get the piece of anymore? paper. That's it. Done. Well, that's too bad. We thought they were going to follow up. And I thought they'd be like, like, hey, so how's your actionable strategy going to work at your company? Like, how are you tran transforming IT with your new leadership kit? No, what they said they're saying is, um, oh, you want to sign up for another class? You probably benefit from our CTO program, which is also $30,000. Yeah, just, hey, give us more money. It's a hard no. Pay us more. It's a hard no. 
Are you happy about? You're not happy about that, are you? <laughs> no I just say that, I, that the, the Luminary Sport Experience is a thousand times better than anything you'll ever buy in any other program, just by virtue of the fact that we are going to make sure that you're doing every single thing that you learn, every single time you learn. You're doing it in real time, real time, right? And you have to be graded on. You can't just yeah, you show up to class and sleep. You're going to be you're actually going to do it. Yeah, yeah, you're going to do it. And that's pretty much like everything we talked about here. We're doing that class, but again, at a much higher level. So, um, last week we wrapped up our discussion on yes, the first two sections of section two. So we talked about budgeting first. Yep. And then last week we talked about, I mean, I mean, uh, we talked about flexibility and planning, but yep. mostly it was IT strategy. But out of that spawned Wargaming. Yep. Uh, I saw your post today. That was very good. Yeah, I did a post on LinkedIn, which is a precursor to, you guessed it, another book. So I spent the weekend sort of, well, not the weekend, since we last met, uh, outlining how a book might go in this. And it turns out I've already written most of it back in 2013. Excellent. So Excellent. I'm gonna, I, did, I did a new outline, kind of. I'm going to fill in some blanks, add templates, add diagrams, and then put that out there as another book people can download for basically not only, like we, we know how to write an IT strategy now, now we have to write everything else that comes along with that. Yep. And I'm, I'm remiss for not including that in the big book. I should have done it. No, I think it'll be good to get all that content out there. But tonight, have we got a treat for you. Oh, yeah. Not only are we doing a comedy routine at Bennigan's at 7.30. Where are we again? Bennigan's. Bennigan's at 7.30. <laughs> but we're going to be talking about governance tonight. Oh, God. Dude, are you so, so stoked right now? This is, this is worth having another beer. Yes, we're going to have to, we're going to have to pause in a few moments to get another beer because I'm halfway done and that's, that to me is running low. Yep. Uh, all right. But before we do that, so you know that most of it, the articles written today about technology are either AI generated or written by people that are trying to make revenue. Yep. Like info world, the computer world and all the other. Yeah, they want to sell that, advertisements. Right, sell advertisements. Yeah, okay. yeah, sure. And so what's interesting is if you look at this, if you go back in time over the last, say, six months and look at the, how, the, how the tenor, that's a big word for you, the tenor or timber of the articles has changed, it went yeah. from a lot of these places being extraordinarily pro-AI. Like, why the fuck are you, why aren't you doing AI yet? And you should be doing AI. Yep. Everyone should be doing AI. The world's going to be running AI. What are you doing? Like, why are you so lazy? Now, everyone's doing AI, or trying to, so what are they doing? They're, sp they're spinning it around. So, um, there's this guy, well, I'll mention his name or where he comes from, but two of his articles have been recently published, but the second one of which came out in InfoWorld. Same, same, uh, the articles are the same, same topic, yeah. but just different writing, different approach. Sure. But basically the same topic, same idea. Yep. And... Uh, like I said, one of those found its way into the Info Week feed uh, this week, and he's he's describing the current approach towards AI as pernicious. Okay. Now, quick quick trivia: Do you know what pernicious means? No. I'm not trying to be like an idiot. No. Because no. nobody uses this word. No, I don't. I it's don't, a, it's no. a thesaurus word. What does it well, mean? The sort pernicious means. I'm gonna read this to you. It means highly destructive, causing insidious harm and ruin, tending to a fatal issue the sky dead, is deadly. Falling. Okay, so again, this is what pernicious means. means. Yeah. Destructive, causing insidious harm and ruin, semicolon. Yep. Tending towards a fatal issue, semicolon, deadly. Okay. Deadly. So, what do you do when you really want to sort of drive home a point? You create a clickbait article on InfoWorld, InfoWeek rather, use the biggest word you can possibly find that has everybody scratching their heads, and then you publish it. So the article is called Three Pernicious Myths of Responsible AI. Okay. As if, as if there were more than three, by the way. But he's, <laughs> he's coming out from like, there's three, and I want to highlight what they are. So, um, I don't know how many InfoWorld readers with their word like pernicious and say like, wow, that's, that's some serious shit right there. Yeah. Because 
I know what pernicious means, and I'm like, wow, that's an interesting use of that word, because usually it's used for, like, uh, airplane crashes, and uh, so very, very deadly car accidents. Uh, perhaps the headlines, right? Like somebody that like, assaults a family and, and does something terrible. Isn't that what every sci-fi movie is about? It's it's very much, it catches your eye. Well, so you to know? call anything pernicious is basically to say that... But it, you won't know what it means. I know what you're it, it, it's, 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 it's pernicious. It's calling it out and equivocating it to all the terrible shit that is actually pernicious. Yeah. So let's find out what he says about why responsible AI is pernicious. Please. And, and, and just so we're clear... There's absolutely zero research provided in this article, and in either of his articles. There's no links given to substantiate any of the claims uh, that he makes. And this is, after all, the denotative... Oh, well, there's another big word. What the hell does that mean? Uh, dictionary definition oh, got it, got it. of clickbait. <laughs> that one I, I kind of knew, but... By the way, if you're playing the calculus of IT bingo, you've, and you've pretty much got the corners done now at this point. Pernicious uh, AI. I like that. We should call that. this the pernicious podcast. Listening to it could be could be fatal. The most likely would be fatal. Screen sharing technology. So we're now the home of the pernicious podcast. That's going to go in our new opener. The pernicious. Pernicious. And if you are being pernicious at home, stop. Um, <laughs> so let's take a let's take a look at the face value of, his, of these assertions. And by the way, just so we're clear, I haven't taken any quote. I'm about to read out of context. Um, so everything's in context, unless you step back and realize the entire article is out of context, in which yeah. case all my art quotes are out of context. But in this case, I'll read some, some choice quotes. So quote number one, responsible AI is needed now more than ever. It's the opener. So it doesn't sound too pernicious yet, right? It sounds no, pretty I think that, that sounds like a good thing. It's unsubstantiated, and we don't really need it now more than ever. Like, we need like solutions to poverty and social ills, but anyway, we'll go with it. And it is the key to driving everything from trust and adoption to managing LLM hallucinations and eliminating toxic generative AI content. Okay. With effective RAI, companies can innovate faster, unsubstantiated, transform more parts of the business, unsubstantiated, comply with future AI regulation, totally unsubstantiated, and prevent fines, which you can't be fined right now, Reputational damage, okay, and com competitive stagnation. Okay, so for stagnation, that's uh, in the second column of the bingo card. Unfortunately, confusion reigns as to what RAI actually is. Again, no substantiation. So confusion reigns. Yep. Are you, are you, is confusion reigning over you? Totally right now. Totally, yes. me too. 100%. Me too. I see what RAI actually is, what it delivers, and how to achieve it with potentially catastrophic effects. Okay, now we're getting to the pernicious stuff. Oh boy, catastrophic. Done poorly, RAI initiatives stymie innovation, creating hurdles that add delays and costs without actually improving safety. I didn't, so we're into safety somehow. So RAI is to create safety. Uh, well meaning but misguided, myths abound regarding the very definition and purpose of RAI. Unsubstantiated. Organizations must shatter these myths if we were to turn RAI into a force for AI-driven value creation instead of a costly, ineffectual time sink. Now, if you'd stop right there, I would have maybe gone, oh, okay, I, there's potentially an argument, but no, no, no. So what are these three pernicious RAI myths? So here we go. Number one, responsible AI is about principles. Now, he's claiming this is a myth. And he goes on to say it's not about principles. In fact, he says, go to any tech giant, and I would, in my own parentheses, say any company, yep. and you will likely find RAI principles, like explainability, fairness, privacy, inclusiveness, and transparency. They are so prevalent that you would be forgiven for thinking that these principles are at the core of RAI. After all, these sound like exactly the kinds of principles we would hope for in a responsible human so surely they are key to ensuring responsible AI, right? It's his question mark. Wrong. <laughs> all organizations already have principles. They don't. Not all of them. Usually they are exactly the same principles that are promulgated for RAI. So if you're promulgated, that's in the fourth column the center. Um,
As well, how many organizations would say that they are against fairness, transparency, and inclusiveness? If they were, could you truly sustain one set of principles for RA, for AI, a different set of principles for the rest of the organization? I mean, this is all specious argument now. He's trying to make an argument where, there, where one doesn't exist. Further yeah. principles are no more effective at engendering, engendering at that trust in AI than they are for people in organizations. Who wrote this? I'm not telling you. I'll tell you after. Oh, oh okay. Do you trust that a discount airline will deliver you safely to your destination because of their principles? Actually, I do. I 100% do. Or do you trust them because of the trained pilots, technicians, and air traffic controllers who follow rigorously and enforced processes using carefully tested and regularly inspected equipment? So two mixed, two mixed metaphors there that don't work. Uh, much like air travel, and there's one more. It is the people, process, and technology that enable and enforce your principles that are at the heart of RAI. So this myth number one started by saying RAI is not about principles. Now he's coming back to say that it is about principles. So that's myth number one, busted. Myth number two, responsible AI is about ethics. Again, I'm quoting, surely RAI is using, about using AI ethically, making sure that models are fair and do not cause harmful discrimination, right? Yes. But it's also so much more. Only a tiny subset of AI use, case, use, use cases actually have ethical and fairness considerations, unsubstantiated, such as models that are used for credit scoring, that screen resumes, or that could lead to job losses. Let me get to the bottom of this one where he says, yep. the same tools that you use to provide explainability, check for bias, and ensure privacy are exactly the same that you use to ensure accuracy, reliability and data protection, unsubstantiated. RAI helps ensure AI is used ethically when there are fairness considerations at stake, but it's just as critical for every other AI use case as well. <coughs> it's a circular reference there. It's what's what we call in uh, database logic, when you make the same point and then refute your primary, primary point. Myth number three, responsible AI is about explainability. I'm going to stop right there. I don't need to read the rest of that bullshit in that myth. It's all about explainability. If I go and ask a generative AI how to develop a protein for a particular cell, and it tells me, and then I go use that information to then do that thing, yet I don't understand the explainability behind how it was generated, yep. I have done something that is not RAI. I need to understand fully how to explain how the answer that I'm given Relates to the question that I asked. That's called explainability. So, yep, I'll get to the end. So he sums it all up by saying, responsible AI is about managing risk. At the end of the day, RAI is a practice of managing risk when developing using AI and machine learning models. This involves managing business risks, legal risks, and regulatory fines, and customer employee lawsuits, and even societal risks. Uh, but note, Everything that he just said falls anywhere into the ranks of pernicious. It falls into no shit. Then there's a big paragraph that says a lot of words, but then says nothing. Sums up by saying, these are the capabilities that advanced AI teams in heavily regulated industries, such as pharma, financial services, and insurance, have already been building and driving value from. Unsubstantiated. They're the capabilities that build trust in all AI or specifically generative AI at scale with the benefits of faster implementation, greater adoption, better performance, and improved reliability. Responsible AI can be the key to unlocking AI value at scale, but you'll need to shatter some myths first. So, that's the end of the article. <clears throat> yep. In that entire article, zero is actually said about perniciousness above AI. And this person who wrote this article has said three things that are actually key to generative AI, which is to have principles, ethics, and above all, the ability to explain what the fuck you're doing with generative AI. So if you want to be somebody who's not going to have any ethics or principles and not going to explain how they use generative AI, just go full road, knock yourself out, you'll find a great companionship with this individual. Otherwise, perhaps slow down, take a step back, and ask yourself, why are we using generative AI in our company? And how can we make sure that we're using it responsibly and include yeah. everything that's not pernicious in that discussion? Yeah. I just, the key is to use it responsibly, right? I mean, that's, 
as best you can if you if you need to use it. The fact that RAI is now becoming a buzz acronym is a little disturbing because it generated out of nowhere. I would actually like to attribute it to Gardner, but Gardner didn't even invent it. Do you I think it's it. created just because of all the noise about how dangerous this is? That, that this is these are the articles that people will read now. Well, I, I want this person to understand that there are now four tech accords at a global scale focused on ethics principles and ensuring the safety of AI. Yep. So you might be coming at this from the wrong angle. Perhaps a new article could be how the world is viewing generative AI ethically. Yeah. How the world is treating generative AI responsibly, not pernicious. But I'll give you marks for the word. You'll take it to the SATs, you'll do great. <laughs> All right, so to cleanse the palate, actually has some good news. Oh yes, what's this? It's not pernicious. I, I, I thought you would like that article. Because that's, that's about, he's trying to put forth a lot of the messaging around responsible AI. I don't know how well he did it there, but. No, he, I don't think he did well at all. Yeah, I mean, it's just, he's, he's just throwing out a bunch of stuff. I think a lot of people already have heard a million times, which is the ethics argument and, you know, non-bias and having review explainability is important, you know, to maintain that you're still actually needed. You know, it's a good, good, important piece. You can explain why these things come up with answers. I don't know, man, yeah. it's getting scary because I think uh, when answers are good enough, like we talked about in the first few episodes, people yeah. will just take them. They're not going to question them. And that's where, you know, you're going to get into trouble. Well, it's only going to get worse. Uh, we'll talk about this in a moment. It's only going to get worse because the speed at which things are advancing um, – yeah, is pretty nuts. We'll talk about what happened uh, just this past week in a moment. But one thing I want to mention this is it's good news. Like from the corner of the internet, every now and then something will pop up that's a good news. It's like a little little flowers that dandelion. So you like you know I like four four media. You read four four media, right? Yeah, I do. So the four uh, four media put out a statement today that they will be staying human on human. That they will only produce human human generated content. They will not be relying on AI. They will continue, they've been doing that. They will continue to do that. And I gotta tell you, I gotta dig the shit out of that. In fact, I think I think that though they're maybe not sort of the uh, tip of the spear on this. Yep. What we will see, and tell me if I'm off base here. What we will see is that you will start to see either a watermark. Or some kind of like thing that goes cool. along with news that says human generated or AI generated. Already and, happening. And human generated will become the better standard. Yep. Depends on where humans go. Right? I mean, yeah, it, 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 it depends, depends on who wins. Really, if, you, if, you, if you see two articles, one says written by a human, written by an AI, which one are you going to read? Today, it's going to be the human one. I don't know about tomorrow. Well, that's I think that's part of the, the, the two-sided sword here is put AI on everything. If people like what AI generates better, just like people like certain news articles better than others. Yeah. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I, I think that, like even, for example, on TikTok now, when you upload a photo, you can say it's AI generated and it's getting more traffic. I have to. I have to actually. <laughs> I have to actually say uh, in my upload YouTube videos now. If there's any AI generated content in it, yeah, I upload it. So this is the quote from their press release or their note: "The internet, as we know, is changing fast. Over the last few months, we have documented how generative AI tools are flooding every internet platform with junk content designed to monetize loopholes of oh, already totally. fraying social media companies and deceive users. AI generated influencers that steal content from real people." Fake images of suffering children and the endless parade of harmful Instagram ads is a toxic media ecosystem that puts profits first and the well-being of real people last. Google search is sending less traffic than ever to sites like ours and is injecting yet more AI into its search products. Yep. Media companies are increasingly turning to AI-generated garbage too. We are building an alternative. Media for humans, made by humans. I fucking love that shit. Good for you, 404. Keep the good good coming. I'll read it all day. I love all their stuff. Yeah, they're, 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 they're investigative journalism. is fantastic. Yeah, they are good. I like reading their stuff. I get, every morning I get their newsletter. Yeah. No, I like having that comes on the digest. No, they're great. They're definitely taking that. It's inexpensive, too. I forget what I paid, but it's inexpensive. Yeah, I paid like $100 for the year. It's it's not much to get. Uh, very cool. What is essentially very, I mean, there's some ex-vice people, I think, right? Yep. 
some, yep. but, but some very hardcore cutting investigative journalism on things that you didn't really know were going on, but they're technologically related. Oh yeah, they're, it's very, very interesting to see where they're going, especially from a lot of the AI and the social media constructs and how they're changing. So since we last met last week, Gemini doubled yeah. its input context window from 1 million to 2 million tokens. It's yesterday, right? Uh, it was actually Monday. What's today? Today's, uh, oh yeah, was it Monday? Yeah. When they did that IO? I thought it was yesterday. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's all right. One of those days. That end, that one of those days that ends in day. One of those days. Uh, OpenAI released GBT 4.0. That was Monday. Which Monday? Which generates tokens two times faster and 50% cheaper than GPT 4 Turbo. I don't know what the O means. You know, I, I didn't. You know what the O means? I don't look it up. I don't. I don't know what, what it means. And uh, it like, also natively accepts and generates multimodal tokens. Yes. So um, this is sort of the latest. It's sort of eighteen month trend. Uh, there's a great chart. I should share it. I don't have it here in the document, but it shows the, the context windows. And it's just like it's not even sort of like a curve. It's just a straight line. And they, they don't see a cliff dropping up any point. Yeah, it's like a, a straight vertical line. Yeah. Um, so since the launch of GPT in November 22, with all the key milestones, GPT-4, Gemini 1.5 Pro, Cloud 3 Opus, Llama 370B, many model, model providers have improved their capabilities into important ways. Uh, reasoning, which is like one of, the, one of the biggest releases, allows LLMs to think through complex concepts, and then, and then longer input context windows. Yep. Uh, this means that for, like, I don't know, do you guys teach Gen AI classes at, um, no. So when I teach Gen AI classes at Exilio, I teach about few shot prompts. And so I've been doing that since last summer. Yeah. Like what's a few shot prompt, how to write one, et cetera, and how to be creative when you write them. Well, so if you know how to write a few shot prompt, and if you use Gen AI, you should learn how to write a few shot prompt. Um, you can now expand that to what they call mega prompts. Yep. I mean, pages and pages of prompts, you can now put into a, a context window. So you'll have a better chance of um, a RACA framed response if you, that's R-A-C-C-C-A, using a... <laughs> so complex. I know. All this stuff, like, well, like you, you see Google's commercial that they're bringing out? The like, Gemini commercial? Yeah. Yeah, it's like everyone can do this. Like, they, their argument's just the opposite. Now, if you write a one or two sentence query, you're fucked. You're, you're the answer, and you yeah. don't take that back to your boss. Like, whatever you're doing, don't rely on it. You got to want to write few shot prompts. Make it your own. And now they've given you everyone the chance to write complicated few shot prompts. Yep. <coughs> I'm not going to go into details. You can Google it. Few, F E W, shot prompts. Google it. Google it. Google Gemini that. See what it says. Okay. That's awesome. Also, in the news, two other things. Uh, Chat GPT has published for open discussion and debate. I don't know how open it's going to be. It's model spec. Which is basically their policies for how their uh, RIHF works. Okay. You can read it online now. Yep. And they're inviting the public uh, to provide commentary on the guidelines. So one of the reasons Exilio adopted Claude, or Cloud, depending on who you are, as our standard is because the difference between OpenAI's RIHF principles, which I don't like, I find particularly scary, yep. and Claude's open constitution. They have open constitutional principles. So OpenAI's use of the model spec is a good step in the right direction. Like they're inviting public commentary, yep. but Claude's already way ahead of you. Anthropic has taken the lead on this. Um, so to steer the behavior of Anthropic models, uh, what they've done is to find a constitution. And these principles are, um, please choose a response that is the most helpful, honest, and harmless, which is the Triple H philosophy. Got it. And do not choose responses that are toxic, racist, or sexist, so on and so forth. So, uh, Claude does not rely on RLHF. It relies on RLAIF. There's a new acronym for you. Uh, okay, so, real live AI <laughs> feedback uh, to interpret behavioral principles. And so, instead of using humans in the loop, which is what OpenAI claims to do, a job has gone way past that. They're now using the bots to uh, narrate the content. There's a whole, there's a whole like potential string here we could go on with Reddit and how this will affect Reddit one day. But yeah, we'll do it anyway. So on the anthropic note, 
uh, which is my last bit of AI news for the day. Yep. They just did a massive overhaul of their terms of service yep. and constitution. I read through the whole thing. I don't know how many people did. It's not that long, and I loved it. They have basically tried to think of every single possible thing that's pernicious in the world and then have baked that into what you can write in cloud. Now, you can still go write terrible shit in Grok or OpenAI and even even Gemini to a degree, but and try it try in cloud. Try and write how to be a Nazi or how to do something pernicious and terrible. No, actually, that's redundant. How do something pernicious? Pernicious and terrible? I'm feeling pernicious. Tell me some pernicious things I can do to my neighbors. They won't want you to do that. So do you say Anthropic is your favorite of all? Yeah, yeah. Now because of those principles. So we're, we're doing, uh, so in June, we're going to be doing a 12-person pilot. So we've been using cloud on an individual level now since I don't know, end of last summer. Yeah, I'm going to be upgrading 12 people to the Pro Edition, the, the Enterprise Edition, $30 a person a month. Yep. And they will get all uh, Opus, Sun, and Haiku, plus all the other features and functionality. Plus, we have a 30 day retention plan, plus, this will be control enterprise live. Yep. That's going to run for one month. Nice. Awesome. Very cool. I will have a second group in July, Pilot Poe. Yep. Because Poe is claiming to be releasing an enterprise model that lets me turn off all the ones I don't like. Yep. And Poe is cheaper. Yep. <coughs> so we'll see. It's a bake off. Yes. Cloud. That's where we're at. Nice. Nice. Let's grab another beer. Yeah, we can do that. Do you want me to grab one for you? Let me grab one. I'll just turn this, I'll take this thing off and I'll be right back. Who's put it on the table? What do you, uh, what do you, what do you got? <coughs> it's called Madonna. Madonna. And I'm going to talk to the people while you're done. Right, hey people, Mike's, Mike's walking away. <coughs> I'm coughing because the allergy season. Um, so, I was being a little bit scathing on that pernicious article, but the general point is this. If you're going to read news about generative AI, and it's really not making a whole lot of front page news anymore in terms of uh, physical print media and most of the uh, generic media sources, it's usually like second or third byline. Um, just be wary that you want to challenge the writers for um, how they're writing their articles. Because there's a big difference between statement of opinion and statement of fact. And if you believe it's fact, you should be able to substantiate what is written. And so a lot of the stuff that's coming out these days, and I just picked one article out of, out of a whole big bunch, um, none of them are substantiated. Uh, so it's very important to either claim that you're completely writing an op-ed piece or that you are in fact. Thank you. Yeah, I got it. Did you get another Michelob light there, Mike? No. That's why you're going to the bathroom so soon. So, other news. I recently hired a new number one, Miranda. She's awesome. And, and she is she represents the next generation of what's happening with um, what people think about IT. And so... Yes, yes. Uh, Crispin. Chris what? Mike Crispin. Thank you. <laughs> Mike just walked away from the bar. You got up there nice and high, by the way. I uh, I just got done trying to get free beers, I guess. Maybe not. There we go. We're good. We're good. I wouldn't trust you either. I, I, look I at think you. they just recognized me. They're like, oh, that's you know who that guy is, right? There's so many people here that look like you tonight. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I thought they probably thought it was a stand-up comedian that's going to be here. I was just talking about my new number one, Miranda. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, next generation. She will be uh, riding, capitalizing on that generative AI wave. And nice. won't be pernicious either. She's anti-pernicious. Oh, anti yeah. pernicious Is pernicious a word? We don't want any pernicious. So oh, worked out yeah. some per perdition is a word. Isn't perdition a means hell. Eternal damnation. But is pernition a word? Is that movie? Pernition is not a word. Oh. Pernicious is the word. Okay. Anyway. So enough you have anything you want to say about AI, Mike? 
Are you no, saying, AI okay? is, there's a lot that's been said, so I'm, I am all set. Okay. There's a lot. A lot going on in the world of AI. So happens when you let me have the mic so attached to my chest. A lot of, um, a lot of things announced. So I'm like AI'd out in the first week. It's like between GPT and, uh, I've been AI'd out. Google and, uh, Apple in a couple weeks. So if you, if you use Pro, I know we've plugged Pro a few times, but Pro gets the newest models right away, yep. baked right in. So, um, I mean, to be quite honest, let's see what's coming out this week. Just too many to name. Um, Pro is the best, I think, multimodal uh, Gen AI solution out there. All right. So last week was awesome, other than the place we were at, which wasn't so great. $20, $24 margarita, which was mostly ice. <laughs> That's true. My wife was like, how many drinks did you guys have? I was like, not as many as you think. Yeah, it's all ice. All ice. Well, they basically were drinking ice and various versions of melted ice. I just couldn't believe we were in a... And we didn't have Wi-Fi, but now we not only do we have Wi-Fi, we have good beer, we have tables, we got a couch. Life is good. Okay, so it's rough. Uh, I did post a summary article today of last week on the Wargaming piece. It's on my LinkedIn. It's also on the Luminary Sports blog. Check it out because I provided uh, from a document I wrote back in 2013, sort of the nine things that my IT leaders would do, the folks that were in my team at the time, to combat... Um, the anxiety around uh, just strategies that kept getting upended. Boy game. All right. So tonight we're going to revisit the monster that is governance. Now governance, if you hear it, you're like, okay, I'm turning this podcast off. It sucks. <laughs> Don't. Because it's actually not a 45-minute governance read. It's short. But that's not even the key. We're revisiting governance as it applies to years two and three. Yep. Okay, we had to get through all that shit in year one because that's what governance is. Like, when you think about governance, it's everything. So, um, the upside, when I, when I went back to the book and redid it this past winter, I really went to great lengths to consolidate the former secondary sections on governance into a model that made sense. So, if you recall back in chapters 15 through 18, we went over governance. There were five domains and tonight we're going to revisit three of them. And then next week we'll revisit the other two. So tonight we're going to revisit prioritization and project management, development and infrastructure. And next week we'll be covering security and data management. So for this week, Mike, the central thesis on governance yep. is that you, uh, like, like with budget and strategy work, should be in the process of maturing your governance in year two, not starting it. Correct. If you're in year two and you haven't done anything for governance yet, you are in a hole, my friend. Yes, agreed. Even if you started your governance with just a single policy, okay, I'm going to put out an acceptable use policy. That's a start. If you did nothing in your first year, the, everyone looks at you like a dead fish. They're just going to run right over you. So you still in years two or three you still need to continue with the governance and governance is a long burn. It doesn't have to be done at once unless you're yeah, very don't, don't do it all at once. Don't do it all at once. Yeah. Because then you'll just be a governance person, not IT. But it will be the backbone of all your decision making. And it's needed for both budgeting and strategic planning. So you have to answer like why are we doing this thing? How are we going to do this thing? Who will do this thing? Who will pay for this thing? Yep. That's governance. You need to be able to answer those questions because it's not like uh, if you don't have governance in place, that's easy. Uh, who's going to? Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, because. Uh, how are we going to get it done? Any way we want. And who's going to do it? Us. And how much will it cost? Well, we're not sure. Well, it'll be like plus or minus hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> that's not governance. That's not governance. That's the. Uh, Perniciousness. That's the let's wing it. That's model. pernicious right there. That's straight up pernicious. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's straight up pernicious. Straight I gotta use that. I'm that making straight up pernicious. Straight up pernicious. That's some straight up pernicious shit right there. That's that's straight up pernicious. 
<laughs> so I'm gonna write that in here. Straight up, straight pernicious. up pernicious. Um, sorry. Whenever I have something clever, that's that's a totally that's totally a shirt. You gotta hold. You no, know, I get the whole shirt already in my mind. Gotta hold on to that one. Next week, by next week, there will be a new shirt in the Calcutta IT store called Straight Up Pernicious. You straight gotta up get that pernicious. shirt. And you will tell people exactly who you are. They'll be like, "Oh shit!" Straight up pernicious. That guy is fucking straight up pernicious. I'm watching out for that. Um, where was I? Okay, so in truth, governance works because you put the idea of governing, govern, yep. in there, which indicates there's some specific lever or guide which will be applied to those decisions. Like, why are we doing this? Well, there'll be a there'll be a guide that tells you why that why you're doing this. In most cases, and not all, but in most cases. This is where the IT steering committee comes in. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, ITSC. The IT yeah, baby. That old chestnut. LFG, man. Uh, that old, did you say that old chestnut? Yeah, that old chestnut. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> that old chestnut. The that IT old. steering committee. That reminds me. Uh, let's take a brief. Let's take a brief pause because I want to tell you something. The chestnut committee. I'm going to use that. I've been maintaining a um, for a long time now a list of old timey sayings, old timey words. That old chestnut. So let me just read a few of these to you. This 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 is please, <laughs> please read them. Horn swoggled. What horn swoggled? I have no idea what does horn swoggled mean. So, so if I gave you like uh, five dollars, yeah. To go buy a, like a beer, and it was only three dollars. But Joe gave me a dollar back. You horn swoggled me. You stole from me. You deceived me. Uh, Weisenheimer. Ah, oh, Jesus, these are good. Are you, are I have no like, idea what this is. I know Weisenheimer is like a smart ass. <laughs> okay, dude, stop being such a fucking Weisenheimer. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a fufara. Fufara. I think I have heard that one before. A fufara is like. Uh, a spat, or like a, like in the do, like we're tussling. Oh, like we are in a little disagreement. We are yeah. in an argument. It's a fufara, a fufara, a um, fufara. Lava lamp. Is flim flam? Is that flip flop? Like no, flim flam is like horn swaggle. You've been flim flam. Like I, you thought you were getting, you thought you were getting a beer, and you said you got bigger of light. So you're you're flim flam, and I got water to water it down. <laughs> Kerfuffle? Oh uh, yeah, that's that's a little that's a little fight like a wrestling match, right? Yeah, it's like a fufara, but like a little bit more than a fufara. Well, didn't oh I'm thinking of the other time. Like you would have a fufara and then escalate to a kerfuffle. Kerfuffle. All right, that's yeah. I had... Um, then there's a uh, highfalutin. High. Right? Am I on with that? Uh, highfalutin. Yeah, you're all highfalutin. Rootin and tootin. Hold on, we're not tooting right now. There's a, there's a whippersnapper. Yeah, what you call it? What's the whippersnapper? Whippersnapper is like, uh, oh, you you like your wise ass, like but, but like a little a little wise ass, like a little kid. Yeah, it's a little, a little whipper, whippersnapper. Like a whippersnapper. There's a wang doodle. Where are you getting this stuff from? I've been recording these for years, literally. In your list. Remember this? There's there's malarkey. I know malarkey. Okay. Uh, rolling dervish. No, I don't know. A rolling, rolling dervish is someone who talks too fast and just doesn't stop moving. Rolling dervish. Yep. I like that one. That's a good t-shirt right just there. Just talking to Yeah, I know that one. Uh, hoodwinked, which hoodwinked. is like a, it was like flim flam. Yep, yep. You know, hoodwinked. And then uh, let's see. There's a. Uh... Let's see. So I want to find one more, one more good one here. Oh, it's a hooligan. Hooligan, hooligan. That's like a a, a hooligan's like a ne'er do well or a Weisenheimer. A Weisenheimer. I like Weisenheimer. What was what was the other one I liked before? Uh, uh I don't know. You know shenanigans, right? Yeah. Shenanigans. Shenan's. Uh, you know that's a fine kettle of fish. You heard that one? 
Yes. Well, that's a fine kettle that's of fish. That's a fine kettle of fish. That's a nice one. Yep. But was there was the uh, the one with all the words, with stream of words. What was that one? Stream of words. The one where it's like the keep keeps going and going. Uh, and, no, flop, floppy Joe. What? Flim flams? Flim flams? No, hold on. Where is it? Keep for all. Uh, keep going down. Mm, uh, I'm the whipper snap. Rap scallion. Rap scallion. <laughs> I love it. Ragtag. Jumping Jehoshaphat. Wow, these are amazing. I know. Dilly dally. I use that one all the time. Gallivanting. When you're gallivanting, gallivanting. about, like, stop gallivanting about and get to work. You Weisenheimer? The, the comedy show has started. Oh, there's a. We're not. Are we supposed to be on stage? No. No, we are not. <laughs> okay. So we're not, good. We're, we're not free. We are not competing with the comedy show. All right. So none of those words, by the way, in that list are pernicious. So, okay. To be effective, where were we? The IT steering committee. To be effective, yes. the IT steering committee needs to have clear processes and criteria for evaluating and prioritizing IT projects based on their alignment with their business objectives, potential benefits, risks, and costs. Okay? Follow me so far? Gotcha. Any IT steering committee or ITSC should also have a decision-making framework that ensures that all stakeholders have input into the process and that decisions are made transparently. So, Mike... First of all, uh, you've been there now for this many months? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where are you in the governance journey? Right now, we're just mostly cybersecurity. We're well, still in the first year, so you can get away with first year. Yeah, but most all this, all the decision making in terms of what we're going to invest in is based on goals. So we're not at the point now where there's um, competing priorities and resources. So we, it's pretty much me and the CFO, and now that Kate's on board, getting her more plugged in, some of the decision-making process. But we definitely need a cross-functional uh, group to start socializing some of the change management we're doing, which would be great for the steering committee, not as much from a project prioritization perspective. But I think it's more of uh, getting the organization for another meeting. Right in terms of what they need, and as more and more GNA organization that leadership comes in, we're trying to insert ourselves in that process. So we, I expect by the end of the year, we do have a an IT kind of operational committee or IT steering committee, um, but we we really need to have it in place for it to be valuable. You get one shot at this stuff with yeah. an executive team. You don't want to put it in just to put it in. So you want to put it in when there's value for the organization, when they know what it's going to do. When they they feel like it's a privilege to be on the committee and to have decision making capabilities and that what they say will be kind of listened to so i think early days it's um you know right now a lot of decisions are you know we brought you into it to make these decisions your team should make them so we can trust you with these decisions so let's let's kind of work about the training aspect we talked about a few weeks ago being kind of the core Getting the message out, what's changing when. But what do you do when the business story. comes forward and, and there's two competing priorities? Oh, we, we have to we have to manage that with a with a committee when we do, or with some sort of discussion between the groups, like on an in case by case basis. Right now, I think okay. with steering committees, and I, you know, I know a lot of our peers have probably experienced this. So, when you put a steering committee in, and and it's just about prioritization. Um, you don't have a you don't have a meeting for six months because there's not a lot of competing priorities. You have got to have other stuff. So your well, standards, yeah. your cybersecurity, other other aspects of it. Whereas I think people often look at the steering committee as the prioritization is key, and even when the business wants it, if the right members aren't there, if they're not, it really is an art to put together a good steering committee. I think, and and know at what time in your an IT journey is the right time to put it in. So I say the steering committee, but have like smaller committees like the incident response committee. Um, you know, if you have data governance, you have sort of uh, standards-based committees, they could make it kind of smaller and more focused to start with, you know, with a company yeah. like ours where we're in 
you know, we have 40, 40 people that are wearing multiple different hats. So early days is get out in front and talk about what your priorities are uh, and then have when the time is right and you've got that budget season. I always kick it a, a new IT steering committee off like, like it'll probably be this year during the budget cycle. Yeah. So That's like, the okay. best time to do it. So like, okay, yep. We're, we're doing something new this year. You know, we're going to get everyone together. We're filled to the brim from a priority perspective in 23, 24, this, you know, based on strategy, we're going to have this much growth. We're making these changes. Now is the time to get everyone together and, and have that group. Make sure you're the members that are appropriate. When I, when I build out an ITSC in the first year, what I do is I, I literally will go through every single person in the company's uh, LinkedIn profile. And it takes a lot of work. That's, that's, that's great. That's and I look at the last three companies and what they've experienced. Have they experienced um, uh, drug, drug production? Have they experienced commercialization? Have they experienced discovery? Yep. Uh, was, what, do, what do they know? And I use that list to then go out and like, grab five or seven. It's, it's, it's got to be an odd number of leaders who have all the experience of all life cycle of the drug. And um, that first committee is assigned for one year. Yeah. Then what happens is I'm asking them to go and pick people out of their groups who, right, who, who they can train, who need this growth opportunity to then be the next generation. If they can't find one, then they can stay. Uh, but ideally, we always want to keep an odd number of people because I don't yes. vote. Uh, I'm a tie-breaking vote. But they vote amongst themselves. Got now, it. we don't That's all, a good idea. In the first year, we not only meet to prioritize, and it could just only be like two projects, but they also meet, and this is important, quarterly to do two things. One, uh, see how the projects that were approved are going. So those stakeholders have to come back and report. But two, if they had something that was already approved before I got there, let's say a very expensive LMS system or ELN. Sure. That leader who originally bought it has to come back to the group and say how good it's working and what they intend to do to keep keeping it. Yep. Um, so you don't get off the hook because you're grandfathered in. You actually have to come back to the IPSC and say, yes, this quarter million dollar platform I have still works great and we're going to keep using it so that when you come forward to ask for something new, you already have established a baseline that that platform is still working. And we're going to grill you. But that first year, it's going to be people that have the best understanding of what it's like to be in a life sciences company. Yep. And this would apply to any industry. You don't have people that sure. understand all the steps involved. Um, so when you're getting to, when, when you have an ITSC in place, yep. 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 so it's built, it's running, how do you ensure that um, what, what people bring forward are sound business cases? Like how do you ensure that you're not not everything under the sun is coming forward? That it's only the things that matter and have impacts. We usually have some sort of input form that kind of aligns the business goals that they they have to enter through. So to even get something to be put presented, they need to come forward with a with usually it's a one slide type thing, for it's the kind of business use case, how it aligns with the corporate goals, uh, what systems they already have that may be doing some of these or a portion of these things. What's the, the estimated cost? And then what's the support? Who's supporting it? You know, if some we do this, how will it be supported? Yeah. Um, and so forth. So it's kind of like a, a template slide that they come in and put in place. Um, and then they're able to present that. And a lot of times someone like the, if you have someone in the IT organization that's working closely with them. Yep. They kind of co-present it together. Right, right. They're, uh, they're, they're sort of helping them prepare the best case. Yes. Yeah. So that stuff all comes in. And I think where a lot of times things get lost is trying to, them trying to quantify what the cost is okay. of a lot of these things. I think that's definitely been, a, in my past, a struggle where it's – and everything is – is 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 a ha it must be done right right so that's where you need some sort of scoring system that's not too complex because I, I did put one together and it was like this is like people were like we could spend so much more time doing other stuff than trying to score what our project 
So, right. So finding a a, 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 um, a simple way to score and have some criteria makes sense. But I feel like, you know, this is just, it, you could have all this stuff all laid out and then it goes to the executive team and they say, no, you're doing this. And, uh -huh. you, you know, you just, that's where it's kind of like, the ITSC is meant as a body, not, it's not, a, not a yes, no body. It should be bringing that information up to the right. executive team. Right, it's a, here's, our, it here's our best approach. Uh, it's you not a yes, vote. Right, yeah. the, the ITSC never says no or okay. says yes. They say, thank you for coming it's, it's in. It's an information gathering body, Yeah. right? And right. it helps you to prioritize. We appreciate your feedback, and here's where we would put you, you based on your your description. And yep. the, then the executive team ultimately has the final veto. So that's one of the things we're talking about tonight is project prioritization and governance. We're talking also about, again, development. And then we're talking about... Um, sorry, like MC just distracted me. Uh, I'm curious. Are you curious? I'm a little curious, but... <laughs> so funny. And infrastructure. Yes. Right. I'm going to start this chapter read, just a small section of it. Yeah. As soon as I start talking, the comedian's going to go on stage and start making jokes. And everyone's going to start laughing. So you can listen to him while I do the read or pay attention to me. I'm paying attention I, I, to you. I, I have questions here for after, by the way. Yeah, I'm listening. I'm here. Okay. So I'm going to read the next section of the second part of the new IT Leader Survival Guide. Uh, it's not a bad read. It's quite short. Hang in there. But we're going to set the stage for years two and three for these three domains of governance. Okay. Yep. Uh, you want to give me a lead in? This is audible. From a maturation perspective, governance is measured not only by increased effectiveness, but also by cultural adoption. Any type of governance you started in year one may have begun as a basic policy, matured in year two into mandatory adherence, has become an automated way of life by year three. Sometimes this process may take longer due to competing priorities, and sometimes the absorption by the company is not ra is rapid, especially yep. if governance has executive leadership supporting it. For instance, project management and prioritization can take many more years to become established practices in the business, depending on several factors, such as the company's rate of growth, yep, exactly. the speed at which the company moves on its programs, and the general complexity of the corporate structure. In contrast, security adherence could happen rapidly if the CEO feels it's a top priority. Ultimately, whether fast or slow, it is tough to predict just how long it will take for any single aspect of governance to take root and become a part of how your organization does business. But all aspects will in time. In a systematic and step-by-step -step model, I will revisit the five governance domains and see how they are maturing in years two and three. Now again, tonight we're only doing the first two. Where necessary, I will also predict where these domains will be headed beyond year three and what else you expect from them. Your timelines may differ from what I am proposing in the coming pages, and that is okay. You may look at these and say, there's no freaking way we'll be where you think we will be in year three. We can't even get this basic policy out of the gate. If that's the case, just keep doing your best to build the governance, and yep. you will get there. Sometimes it will, see, it will seem like it takes forever. And then your company will hire just the right person, or the right event will occur, and your governance will take off like a rocket. For this chapter, I will assume that, at the very least, you have started the work on each of the five domains, even again if that means you only deploy the basic policy. The domain number one, prioritization and project management. Where you should ideally be after year one. Again, these are ideals. You have instituted the basics of a prioritization process for technology consumption. Yep. At a minimum, the basics include you and the CFO prioritizing technology using the best available data, preferably both empirical and objective. Ideally, a slightly larger team is empowered to prioritize technology decisions if they're within specific criteria of importance. Business lines that require technology that meets the criteria for prioritization have been trained in creating a functional requirement specification, and they understand how to write a business proposal justifying the need for the technology. You have helped them each to do this and throw a significant amount of weight behind the process without doing all the work for them, of course. Yep. You have now formally deployed this across the business as many functional lines do not yet need it. The word has gotten out. 
technology decisions prioritized for years two and three are then placed on a timeline, considering all time, financial, and resource aspects. The timeline also considers the company's growth and the possibility of resources not yet in place today. You have used this timeline for any rolling forecast and planning. Strategic, that is. Yep. During the budget process for year two, you met with all functional line budgeting managers and key stakeholders to continue the dialogues on the technology needs for years two and three. We now have a much more comprehensive understanding of the business's technological roadmap, at least in the desired state, than you did in the first 90 days. From an accelerating third pressure perspective, well, technology projects that may be essential to the business, uh, like for instance, CRM for commercial, QMS for validation, MLR for regulatory, et cetera, could force you to accelerate the FRS education, functional requirement specification, education, and introduction process. Additionally, these same technology demands can impact resource availability for projects downstream. These projects are also deemed essential and may have been identified too late to get properly prioritized by whoever was making the decisions. The needs for essential projects may delay the ability to deploy a functional requirement spec, business case proposal process, or wrap prioritization around the needs, especially if those decisions were made before your arrival. For example, if you are hired right after the company purchased the CRM solution, you must forego the objective assessment of that CRM or ask for a functional requirement spec. Now, you may still be able to utilize a functional requirement spec for any phase two or later elements of the platform, but it is now what it is. The chances are now, the chances are that you knew about CRM though through the interview process, so this shouldn't be a surprise. Yep. Lastly, from an accelerating pressure perspective, you may find a technological gap that requires immediate attention, like security. While such a gap would typically need to be prioritized, it is deemed far too important not to do it right away. Decelerating pressures? Well, you or another executive could determine that the business is moving too fast, that any stoppage could harm strategic goals. This may delay the launch of your prioritization process or project planning initiatives. Budget adjustments can also have all types of negative impacts on governance. When there are no projects to deploy, you do budget reductions or slow down a business, and there is no need to create a prioritization or project management process at the outset. For example, your entire first year could have been devoted to tactical responses only, and based on key stakeholder feedback, you just don't see, foresee any worthwhile technology projects planned for the future. So you can slow it down. From a year two aspirational perspective, the next step in year two would be to formally recognize the IT steering committee and roll out the business's technology project process. This would be done via company-wide training or pre-recorded videos for staff to watch. The rollout would include communicating to the business about what types of projects fall within the scope of the ITSC. Yep. How to present a business proposal, how and when the committee meets, how projects are prioritized, what happens after the project is approved, etc. Roll out a formal platform to the business, and this will be used to manage projects within the prioritization committee's judgment. This way, the business at large can see the progress of every project. Resources can be appropriately assigned to tasks, conflicts can be mitigated at enterprise scale, and accountability becomes a staple for success. In terms of year three aspirations, it's far too early in the organization's life to attempt to implement a centralized project management organization structure, or commonly known as a CPMO. Even an approach to create a decentralized structure is wholly unnecessary, otherwise known as a DPMO. You are fine with your model and should continue fine tuning the prioritization process as it is. The project management process is continuing to grow nicely. And now, your entire IT team should be as knowledgeable as you about how to properly manage a project. Whether as a business partner to a team outside of IT or within the IT group itself. If resources are available, take the time to refresh the prioritization team so that others can participate in this essential governance process. If resources are plentiful, this should be done every year. Groups previously approved in year two for technology projects 
should be completing their projects or have already completed them. During this period, they will return to the team for annual check-ins to provide feedback on whether or not their approved technology are demonstrating the value they assured you that they would. Lead project teams through a post-mortem between three to six months after a project goes live. This allows all team members to review the project's positives and negatives, which can all be used to improve the process further, also known as continuous improvement. And you may want to consider hiring an IT project manager, man, uh, IT project manager in year four. You may already have considered or hired niche business relationship managers as subject matter experts for specific technology projects and functions. These roles will merge in the future to form an internal IT project management team. Now switching gears to the second domain, development, where you should ideally be after year one. If your company has no serious development aspirations, you should have successfully instituted a basic control model for API management and other simplified development requests. Employees can freely use API scripts with whatever acceptable governance scope you have established a policy or platform control. You are encouraging citizen development by selecting the best tools and methods for them to use. Now suppose your company is either in the growth stages of having a group dedicated to software development or has already reached maturity. In that case, you should have forged a partnership with the leading member of that team to ensure that your governance measures are being adhered to vis-a-vis -vis testing, code control, etc. You should be able to demonstrate what changes occurred in the business in year one from a development perspective. This is important. Now I'm going to go off script for a second. If you do have development in place in your company and you are putting governance in place, you should be able to at any point in time say what development has occurred. Lastly, you may have also preemptively connected and secured a partnership with an external third party development firm to whom you can call if you need additional development or development resources at any time. Accelerating pressures. While well, the business may connect two or more disparate platforms to enable an outcome tied to an urgent need. In this case, you must exercise your relationship within your third party or internal resources if available to ensure that the development performed aligns with the request that was, that was asked. You also may find some significant advantages to developing software or a scripted app to further technological objectives. You can exploit many APIs with platforms to your advantage with minimal effort. Decelerating pressures? Well, there's really only one. Development resources may be removed from the business or budgeted down to utilize funds and resources elsewhere in the company. This doesn't necessarily stop low-code, no-code development, but it will slow large-scale development initiatives. Accelerating the use of code repositories and available API scripts to achieve some of the same functionality may help. So for instance, at Exilio, we recently lost a key developer as part of a reduction in force, and so we have stopped development because there is there's simply no uh, reasonable means to continue to go forward as we were at the moment. Now, year two aspirations, and for the record, I'm in right in the middle of year two. Continue to educate all users, especially those who tend to tinker and push technology beyond its box limits. At the very least, explain how tinkering relates to governance and why a good process is essential. For instance, if you have somebody that's just going out using Zapier and writing Zapier scripts, it's not, it's not too hard for you to go to that person and say, hey, honestly, can you document your scripts for us? Yeah. Let them use Zapier. It's an awesome tool. But maybe a little bit of documentation to understand why they did what they did. It's, again, in the year two aspirations, Establish a bona fide code repository internally or via a third party environment like Git, where development employees can store their projects and follow proper version standards. Lastly, plan a roadmap that considers potential middleware stack development in years three and four, and how that may be needed to prepare for eventual cross platform communications, for instance, ERP to HRIS. For year three aspirations, you should seek to provide updates to the governance within the direction of development from the current the organization. It is difficult to plot out this course in a guide such as this that I've written, considering the myriad paths your company may take regarding development. Hiring development within IT at this stage has already been plotted out. 
So you are primarily looking for any of the major course corrections that have been developed and then just adjusting as necessary. In the third and final domain for tonight is infrastructure and operations. Where you should ideally be after year one? Well, you should have documented your policies and procedures for cloud management, data backup and restoration, physical access, if it falls within your scope, change control, and IT services. The first four are primarily for IT consumption, but should be available to the business as needed. Finance and legal will also be interested in ensuring these policies exist and are accurate. The fifth area, IT services, will primarily incorporate your service level agreement and detail the new hire and termination workflows as part of your employee experience. You have implemented a help desk platform, or at least a help desk process, which should include a change control aspect. If not, you have also implemented a change management database environment to support the growing number of change or controls you are now experiencing. Of course, you can't do good change control without at least two people in IT. Before making infrastructure decisions, you have ensured that vendor selection and platform implementations are based on specific requirements to ensure that vendors meet the minimal security, data integrity, and compliance acceptance levels. A data backup process has been implemented, and all data deemed essential to the business is backed up for an optimal schedule or schedules. To whatever extent possible, all data has been tested for restoration capabilities and accounted for in a policy that's kept current with changing technologies. All of this is accessible via global infrastructure and backup map. You have rested control of all public and private cloud access control from staff and your MSP. Though some may still be allowed access to various aspects of it, all central keys are now managed by IT. Where possible, you have removed all named accounts from accessing platforms and replaced them with service accounts. You have also added IT staff as a secondary administrative account as needed. All passwords are securely stored. Access has been restricted to physical equipment in the corporation's physical facilities, and only authorized staff are allowed access to areas and equipment controlled by IT. You receive our reports every month on who has access to these environments at a minimum. Lastly, you have started to create a plan for infrastructure and redundancy that ensures business continuity in a disaster. For accelerating pressures, well, we have two. None of these governance aspects for infrastructure and operations should be delayed. However, you may prioritize some over others. For instance, if your MSP has all administrator accounts on your platforms, you will want to prioritize taking those over immediately and removing the MSP from your business. Still, once you arrive on site, you will address all infrastructure needs immediately. Another scenario that illustrates accelerating pressures is where you may have your partner's hiring schedule for later in the year. Still, due to the complexity of the infrastructure and the potential problems with it, you will need to either accelerate that head and get them hired earlier or augment the gap with third-party infrastructure expertise. For decelerating pressures, there is no scenario in which you should decelerate governance for infrastructure and operations. From an aspirations perspective, a global infrastructure map should be kept up to date and reflect all aspects of management, control, and data flow. I recommend LucyChart, use whatever you want, get the map done and in place. Hire a second staff member or use third-party augmentation support and provide redundancy for your IT partner. So either hire another person in IT or get some other measure that, that get some redundancy for that number one. This will allow them some breathing room to work on larger scale strategic projects. Create automated workflows to support common infrastructure tasks, GPO rollouts, Wi-Fi cert deployments, etc. To create better controls over governance enforcement. Improve physical infrastructure service areas and ensure the governance standards are aligned. Although you may have had to shoestring the physical and virtual environments in year one, now is the time to improve them and ensure scalability that they continue to be used. And lastly, now that you have a global asset management catalog in place, you should strive to find ways to automate changes and eliminate manual upkeep. Asset management touches on many aspects of governance and manual updating always leaves room for mistakes. For year three aspirations, there are two. 
Governance, maintenance should now be a recurring event. I recommend quarterly reviews. All processes are consistently reassessed, maps are updated, policies are updated, and all changes are reflected accordingly. And lastly, if the business has grown proportionally to the need, the help desk or help desk services may grow by an additional head. Whether you have hire someone junior or senior will depend on the types of issues coming into the business. You will want to strongly consider a role that can also be a teacher to work with the business and strengthen the pro proactive environment you're creating. This will further strengthen the ties to the SLA. Well, I don't want to be presumptive or pernicious, <laughs> but I think we actually made governance slightly okay. If only for a few yeah. minutes. I think that's uh, all those points make sense. And you mentioned timing and a few of those points makes a lot of sense. And all of it, all of it obviously makes sense. But it's, uh, it's tough. That's always, it's always a hard, steering committee stuff is hard. Infrastructure and operations completely agree. That's, that's probably where you should start and make sure in year one you have those things laid out. Yeah. You have a, a procedure, a process, because largely no matter what company you're at, the expectations are that you have infrastructure and operations under control. Like that's, you know, all to the service level, to the to the infrastructure, to your cloud, to your, 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 your traditional IT services that you, you have, that you're running a, a good, efficient shop, right? That you're yeah, doing well, it the right way and that you can it's repeatable. It doesn't take too much resource over and above what is expected, what you've set the expectations as. And then you we talked about this last week. I mean essentially if I have a budget and that budget reflects what I need to do from an IT perspective. So yeah. I need I need to buy this new switch. Okay? Yep. I need to implement this new platform for security. Yep. Like I, have, I have answered the question of why. Yep. And to a degree, I've answered the question of who. And, and how is implied. I'm just going to plug it in and turn it on. Yeah. That's up to, to Jimmy to figure out. <laughs> but I, I am prioritizing the budget. Yep. Or, and based on my strategy, these things. Yep. So, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of operating in an isolated bubble. So how do I create my strategy? Well, I... I talked to the key stakeholders. Yep, yep, yep. I listened to the corporate goals. I aligned everything. I also need to keep IT alive. Uh, I need to. I need to sort of make sure the business can keep moving forward. Yep. Uh, I need to hire people. I need to have them do things right. So all these form this basic sort of natural sense of governance. But the day I go out and I say, "Okay, everybody, here's a new policy on multi-factor authentication that you're all going to follow," we're going to be like, "What the fuck?" Mm -hmm. Where is this coming from? It, it's, it's, you have to start putting governance into the vernacular. Like everyone that you talk to, and I do this early on. Like yeah. when I start having my key stakeholder interviews, I ask a question. How do you feel about IT governance? And I get a lot of like blank stares. I say, well, yeah, I'm asking, I'm asking a lot of people, though, they hear the G word and it's, nope, you're a small company. What yeah. are you doing? Well, so that's why I think you got to rebrand it a little bit too. Like... Whether it's enablement or it's prioritization committee or whatever, like you're going with the governance. Some companies will be like, "I just left a company because of that." You know what I mean? Like we yeah. understand the value, but I think it's going in and that's because they came from a company where they had a probably a decentralized or centralized PMO that was saying you can't do anything without X or sure. Y. It took a lot of work to get things done. That's not. Good. I mean, that's that's but, an aspect of governance. Oh, sure, sure, but that's the that that's what you've got to educate. A little bit on. Oh say, yeah, this is not about governing. It's about enabling. Well, that's why you need to have it. So it's and so I, you know what I mean. This is where you need to have people that are not you helping to make decisions that are in the best interest of the business. Yeah, it's a team effort. Yeah, it's right. a cross-functional effort. Where, where do companies fall into the trap? Well, they get it to a point in time where they create a centralized or decentralized PMO. That PMO prioritizes the company's outcomes over every other decision. So you as IT might walk in there and say, we need a new switch, and they might say, nope, it's more important to buy the CRM. And you might, you may lose because 
you, you're, you're lacking the capability to now get in there and do this. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's advantageous, actually, to... Let me back up. Here's where things get difficult. If you, as the head of IT, go into a company and establish governance, no, sorry, governance and prioritization, that's a good thing. If you stay as the owner for years and years and years, and you're the one running the show, that's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. That is you becoming now the uh, chief rule maker. I'm not saying back out of it. I'm saying you have to always have people involved. And I, I think that's that's a good point because if, if governance means so, your head of IT is a gatekeeper and is a you know, empire builder and everything else, right? Then you, you've already failed. That's why I removed myself from the yes no role. You're I'm not saying failed. yes or no. I'm saying when. Mm -hmm. Like if you come and ask for a project, and I, I'm like, that's a great idea. We're going to need that. Uh, unfortunately, we only have X resources and X money this year. Yep. So why don't we prioritize it here? Yep. Now you, like nine months from now, you might say, as a business owner, oh, I need it in six months. Yep. And so I'll go back. I'll say, okay, well, listen, do it in six months. This person needs to get pushed. And they have a high priority. This is where having other people in place to, to, to weigh the odds. I'm just sitting there saying, listen, uh, it's a great idea. You're absolutely right. No, and so the yes, no comes always back to the executive team. So it listen, always should. And it always should. Yeah, uh, we, at least in a smaller company. We yeah. have heard the cases. We have weighed out our options. And here's what we think is the best order. And we're now presenting to you. Yeah. Here's where the risks are come in. Like, here's where the conflicts are. What do you say? And, and I mean, when you get a bigger company, the expectation is that you're able to give them the full picture and they can go eat check mark. Right? Yeah. So once you get bigger, it's you, you that, that uh, or you get more established and your processes are, are better baked as that steering committee becomes the, okay, in Q1, we're doing these three things. Yeah. Good? Good. Q2, we're doing Good. these three things. Good. And then uh, questions and you get a, maybe a follow-up meeting with more detail or something like that if needed. But that's ultimately, I think, what you get to that C level is expecting certain things. It's like just give it to me in a bow, you know, and and they'll go okay. But when you're smaller, I think it's you got to go up to and say, look, this is the money I've got, and this is this is where you came back to. Um, there was the question earlier about well, what if you have conflicting priorities. Uh, I think the smaller organizations, you, you need you're going to need the executive team to help you make that decision. Yeah. That's not going to be some magic that's going to happen within the room and you're all going to come to an agreement. You're going to need them to step in. And, all right, so and tell me if you agree with this statement. I'm going to make a statement, say I, I agree or disagree. When it comes to governance, other people yep. cannot do great, but IT must always be perfect. Can you repeat that one more time? Sorry. When it comes to executing governance, yep. Other other functions can oh, be can be okay, yep. and not great, but IT must always be perfect. Um, I wouldn't say perfect, but you should excel and be better than others because of the unique position they're in, being the cross section of the business and having so much. It's an opportunity uh, more than it is a. You should seize that opportunity by having that as one of your best practices. Is what I'd say. Um, and there are other groups that should be just as good. Um, well, so uh, let me explain why I said that. So um, let's say you have functional line. Uh, let's say let's say let me give, let's give me a better example. A functional line has come forward to IT mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and said, "We need your help to. We want to implement this platform." Yep. Now, either either you or if you're big enough, you have a, a business liaison is going to work with them and help them make the business case and make the functional requirements facts and make the presentation. Okay? Yep. They come forward to the the ITSC and they're terrible. Yep. Or they're really good but they do a terrible job at executing the project. Would they be allowed to come back without any prejudice against their future projects yeah. or would they like, as a blank slate 
or would their poor performance carry forward? Because in IT, I believe it would carry forward. Well, you guys have run over budget three times. Yep. A functional line, what kind of uh, grace do you think should be given? I think often because IT has the largest budget, they're often uh, not even close. I mean, the largest GNA budget. GNA budget, yes. It's often an operational cost, and it's another debate of centralizing the budget. I think I'll. I guess I agree in some respects that they need to be, we, I wouldn't say perfect, but I think needing to be accelerated and better than others. It's just, um, if, you, if you've got your, your budget centralized, then you're, you're doing the organization a service by managing all that and being of able course. to explain it, right? But, if you're not great at it, then this is kind of your point, I think. Uh, you're going to lose your budget. Stuff that you want to do for your team, that gets deprioritized. Because you get such a large budget and you've got all these projects that are business projects that you're trying to manage. So with the exception of cybersecurity, that innovation budget we talked about last week, all that stuff, like, there's a way because you, you, you are essentially got to prioritize the business projects that align to those business goals and everything is an emergency. Yeah. Now, when you push those budget items out into the business lines, which is also a very good way to do things, now the communication changes in the steering committee is to you to communicate what your resource model is. Because they have the budget, and if they don't use it, they lose it. And if you're stopping them from using the budget because you don't have the resources, then you're going to get a bad name. So either way, you've got to be good at managing your shop and what you're able to do and be very much uh, communicating out constantly about where you stand, around your strategic plan, around your timing, around your tactics, around the why, what, and where you're, why you're doing things, awareness. It just has to constantly be... Uh, no matter where the budget lives, uh, a communication exercise over and over again. And some of that is the steering committee and the governance of that. I, I look at it less as governance and more as communications and consistency. And just being consistent and having a message and being able to consistently say the same things over and over again yeah. and not really waver and change unless the whole business changes. And having a form to do that. And a lot of times that is some sort of IT group or IT committee. So it's okay. just using Slack and using the intranet or whatever it might be that you use to get the message out and keeping keeping people plugged in and engaged yeah. in, in the business. Because that's so important. I, the reason I, I hesitate sometimes with the steering committee is that I, I think to the, the reputational risk and so many other, I think, IT leaders. It's probably the number one question I hear on forums and stuff is how do I do the IT steering committee? Yeah. Because A, I can't get people to show up after two weeks. B, they don't feel like they're decision makers. So they don't come, like, they aren't. They're, they're information gatherers, Huge. right? So they're like, what am I doing for you? You know, I'm just, I can go, I can go back door into the executive committee with my awesome project and, and have a, you know, a conversation a backdoor conversation. Then they now it's the executive committee comes to you and says, "Go do this." You yeah. know, you've got to have that that platform and that trust and credibility built. This is why you can. Oh, sorry, you're up. I was just going to say, every, everyone thinks it's a steering committee. I need a steering committee. I need it. It's like, yeah, great for three months until people, if it's not managed well. Uh, don't go. Or they don't show up because they're not getting anything back. Well, this is that balance, season. right? So you, you don't want to start too early. It's, you don't have anything to do. You don't, to want, do. You don't want to start too late. Yeah. Now you're 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 basically entering the technological debt and resource debt. Yep. Just picking the right time to do it, but yes, to a degree. And you got to challenge. You're not. You're going to be not afraid to challenge people too, like in those meetings. Or there, there has there has to be executive buy-in, like the yep. executive team. If they, if the executive team is going to railroad your process, then get out of that company. 
you, you, you made a bad decision. Yep. It's okay. Move on. Go to another company. Don't tell anyone you went there. Chuck it off your resume. Because if that ET won't stand behind your prioritization and governance process, bad juju. Yep. Bad juju. And that's, that's, just, that's usually a fundamental governance problem, not IT governance. That's a well, governance but, but it also problem. depends on not understanding the value of it, really. Yeah, right? yeah but that's if you, people come off too strong to like, Day, day nine. I'm going to governance this whole place. And we talked about this. <laughs> don't over governance it. Yes, you, sir. That, that just bad news. You come in and say, hey, listen, uh, you know what would be really great if we had some basic policies in yeah. place? And, that and goes so over really well. Like, just that looks great. Toe in the water. Uh, and oh, by the way, I know we have three big projects coming up. I'd like to make sure that we're all aligned. So, is there anybody here that wants to talk about alignment of these projects? Because I only have one resource. No. So there'll be a lot of people happy to do that. Sure, just you simple make it that simple. They'll be happy to do it. As you grow, my so my position is if you're a functional line and you come forward and you've worked with IT to develop a plan and then you completely bungle your project or your thing that you did, yeah, whether through over money, over time, over resource, yeah, um, you can still essentially repent. And do a better job your second time, but if you're showing a pattern of dereliction and you just can't get your shit together, you are deprioritized over everybody. Everyone else would go before you. Like that's where I would do it. And, when, and even though I don't have like a voting power in the ITSC, I would compel the ITSC to deprioritize you over any other initiative that that was using those same resources. Yep. Um, there are just some people who can't do this. It's just a function. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough. It can be hard. But it's it's good to have your mind in the right place and have some basic structure and information that you can communicate on yeah. a consistent basis. I'm going to go to the potty. I hear you. Over and over. Right? Sure, yeah, yeah. You are here? Absolutely. No, I'm good for now. Thank you. You're not going to bring your mic? What's it? I'm not thinking of my <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I, I think a big, big part of the, the overall governance picture is I've often heard the, the steering committee piece. It's good to have a cross functional group that you just get together with, even informally. It can always help. It can be at lunchtime, it could be when you go out walking. Right? Could be anything. So having an ability to talk with other uh, peers and, and leaders within the business to consistently, I should say, in a consistent manner with a consistent message about your plan. Consistency is so important. Unless you have a, unless you have to deviate from that for some reason, but you're going to be consistent with the message why he had to deviate. So. It's um, it's important. One other thing we didn't talk about was standards perspective. Is uh, uh, is uh, steering committee of standards? Go around the committee. That. that looks good. Another beer is is uh, is standards. So a great thing to to do is with your steering group or just your IT cross functional group leadership group advisory board. We called it sometimes IT advisory board. Is is to talk about your standards. And why IT standards are important. Maybe architecture standards are important. Cybersecurity standards, and to get buy-in and understanding and opinions of the group of how those will fly and if they will impact their business or not. To bring that forward and talk about some of those things, and give examples of how you've seen them implemented in the past or how they are implemented now and how they will be measured in the future. And a lot of people have opinions about that. It won't be uh, dead air when you say this is the standard application. Someone would always say, well, I used this in the last place and you should think about this or that. So uh, that's another area of that cross-functional group that's important is talking about standards. But I totally think it's a year two thing depending on the size of your company. Um, if you're coming into an organization that you're being hired to implement more structure and governance, then maybe you do it earlier. 
you're coming in to build an IT organization, you don't want to rush it. You do not want, in my opinion, you do not want to push it fast and, uh, and put it in place before anyone really knows why you need it. Um, sometimes that's a great checkbox thing for governance. The first question someone asks is, do you have an IT steering committee? Yeah. Make sure the business wants that first. Because if they don't, two years later when you come to put it in place, you'll be hoodwinked. Well, only thing I was talking about, Nate, was... Uh, I see it in the bathroom next minute. Yeah. So I can listen to the um, live version of Tracy Chapman and Darius Rucker doing You Got a Fast Car. Pretty good. Oh, in the bathroom? There was this in the bathroom. I was just sitting there for a while. I'll definitely have to go in a couple of minutes. Maybe they'll play it again. It's, it's actually quite soothing. I was soothed when I was listening to it. I love that I just, song. I just felt things naturally happening. I did that song uh, two weekends ago. Was it last weekend? With Darius Rucker. No, it, he'd uh, probably do it with you. No, not Terry Strucker. Um, the other singer in, in, in my band, we played Manchester. It was awesome. In our band, I should say. The group's Manchester. band. And we did that fast car. It was awesome. That's a great song. I feel like, that, by the way, I, I'm, I'm, not cover, I'm not crossing the line when I put my elbow here. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with it. I know, but you still have your, you can still do your elbow. Yeah. So we can touch elbows? No. We wouldn't even touch elbows. We have plenty of room, right? Yeah. Um, so I also want to talk about um, the other two domains real quick. One was development. Yeah. And so uh, you have somebody on your IT team who's a very big fan of scripting. Yes. In yes. all things. Yes. She, she works for me too. And I'm a very, very big fan of scripting, of using APIs. Automation. Uh, making things automate themselves. Um, yeah. And that is governance. So or, respects it is. Some, I, I think there's, there's um, it's funny, we and Kate were talking over about this today, is, is knowing when to build versus buy. I think that's a tough one. At a small company, you have the ability to build, I think, a little bit more. Which is, which is exciting. Then there's also the, the question of uh, business continuity, right? So if you've got, if you're scripting everything. Um, and you have good governance. And you have good governance. So good comments, uh, good documentation for all those scripts. Everything is written down. And that becomes a lot of work. I think that's the thing. We've got we to gotta make sure of, that the things that we're writing and we're building are... Um, we have the time to really put that governance in place. Yes. So we've got to we've got to sort of pick our poison. And that's uh, what do you want to write? What do you want to uh, to automate? And there's a huge upside to that because we truly build our own custom experience and employee experience, which is is humongous. And then there are going to be other things where it's like, let's not take the time to build that. Let's let's just go buy this little cheapo thing. It didn't hold us over a year or two. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think it's also part of the development of, of anyone. It's kind of that build, and, build versus buy, knowing when, or knowing some of the criteria in which to think about, um, when can I just push the buy button, the single click button on Amazon and live with okay or good enough? Or is this a situation where you have a real opportunity to derive some value by building something? All right. Well, I think, I think honestly, you, it's easy to get hung up on one or two principles. The principle, number one, is that you think of development as coding, and that doesn't really relate to governance. Or Not you, but people no, no, do. Just, you just brought up uh, automation and coding. Yeah, automation. But, but the point is that um, if I think if you're fundamentally answer, answering the, the questions of who, how, and, and where, yep, or even when, then you're entering into a governance realm. And if, if I'm going to go ahead and connect A to B, make them talk to each other, yep. API I've answered, libraries, uh, right, I've answered those yeah. questions, and that falls under governance. And That's governance right. is really that big of a superseding principle. Yeah, so it's basically rules. Rules and it's rules. Yeah. It's how you do things. It is the recipe. Yep. Uh, so I think about development. Yes, right. If I'm going to go ahead and part around an air table for a day, trying this, trying that, and then getting it all the way I like it. Yep. I don't need to document everything I failed at. Of course not. No, but the final not. thing that I like, I need to document. Yep, yep. 
absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so that so that someone can pick it up. So that someone can pick it up and walk away, and that you're not end up doing it. And I'll tell you, this Airtable is capabilities is amazing. It's some of the stuff you can do. It's insane, there. dude. And that's and that's the thing. Like, you think Airtable or Snowflake or anything else, you could go in there and you can, you can get. Like it's amazing. Like I'm I, I, with it. I took this weekend and did a lot of playing with it, and uh, Monday I played with it a lot too. It's unbelievable the things that you can start to build in there. But it, it's a database. It's less of an application from what I've seen so far, and it's more of a data. It's a data model. It's structured data, right? Structured data. And that and that is what it is. It's not a front end. It's a bit of a front end system as as um. Doesn't matter though because they can no, pipe out to anybody that's, else. That's the point, right? Yeah. Is you you need if you can use that as the source of truth, huge value. But you've got to know when that part of it ends, and they'll continue to build out to that layer layer seven area, right? But right now, it's still pretty clear that they're it is a relational relational database system, yeah. and they continue to build that front end experience. So I, I look at it as a, uh, a short exposure, you know, talking about maybe seven months time, d d dabbled with it when you had mentioned it to me, and even more so, Kate's been fantastic in it, I'm learning so much from her, and just how, how to work it, and how to what, what the use cases are, but it's, it's also thinking that as... Where does where does this fit in the grand scheme from a business yeah. application perspective? Well, it's easy to look at. You can easily just build everything. Well, it's, you it's want. easy to look at her table, her table as a hammer for every nail. That's right. Yeah. It's not. And you do want to keep it in focus. Yeah. But but there's a competitive advantage there too. There, right? There's a good. Well, it's. You can I think it's the name of the law. I'll have to look it up. There's a law that came out a bunch of years ago in IT. It was like all, all systems will eventually have email. Uh, it's, it's like Visual Basic. Yeah. So <laughs> you can even take myself. You can do database work in Lucid right now. Yep. Zapier has database functionality. Or what yeah, they call Zapier tables, right? Yeah, Zapier tables. Yep. So, so, the, so, I mean, we're getting way out of topic, but that's okay. No, no, that's so the idea is that if I have a data source, it now matters. It now only matters how logical I want that data to be because it, it by default is structured now. Yeah. And then what I can do with it in sort of representation, that's where the war is being fought. The and presentation. The presentation yeah. layer of, yeah. of that. And it's not even a war. I mean, if I can, if I can push a Google Sheet to Lucidchart and then Lucidchart take that file through Zapier, push it to something else, yep. and embed it in a box folder, what have I accomplished? Well, I've just taken data that probably could have just been looked at in raw format, maybe. Yeah. But I made it really cool. Or maybe I did solve a big business problem. I think there are a lot of business problems to be solved. In the, in the, but you have to apply you have to things with an automation lens. Like where the, one one interesting thing I was thinking about is actually this afternoon when the some of the bells went off was how does this differ from Microsoft Access or FileMaker or any of the tools that were like, like I built a great little database, and it does this really good business use case really well. But I, with the exception of FileMaker, because I, I think FileMaker had a great front end experience, and that's where, like, if I want to, um, like, if like we were, Kate and I were talking about audit trails today, right? And inside of a inside of a Airtable and similarly in a SQL database, the way to to create or, or um, FileMaker, not, not so much FileMaker because FileMaker is an audit trail, but Microsoft Access is that, okay, now we got to create another table to do an audit trail. Something that's built in to most enterprise applications. We now have to script and build off to the side, right? We have to write that code. That's additional work. Right, but the benefit is that we can make that audit trail very specific to our needs. That's always the benefit of being able to write write the code, and that's that's when it's a decision making. Okay, do we want to write this, or do we want to use a capability within the system? And that's um, you could have principles, governance principles that you know maybe it's level of effort, maybe it's cost, maybe yep. it's whatever. 
but you say, okay, here's when we're going to build versus buy. And sometimes that's a steering committee thing if you're at a bigger company is to be like, okay, this is a BVB. We don't have a development shop, so it's a, uh, it's a buy. And we don't have development governance, so it's a buy. If it's a build, what's the cost estimate? What's the time? And if you're trying to, you have to take a day to learn how to do it. You got to build that into the cost. Yeah. If you're if you're going to measure that stuff, but I don't think at a company our size we would. You're talking about well. So when I mentioned functional requirement specs, yes, sure. Functional requirement specs are an old timey way of thinking. It's got multiple names. Yeah. But of saying. I'm gonna. I need to buy something that does A, B, and C. Yep. And to do them this way, like you would write it out, you would describe it in English. Sure. And something that does these things. It's no like the same thing happens with uh, somebody who submits a new sprint request for uh, agile development. Like I need, I need something to do X, Y, Z. If you deviate from X, Y, Z and say, ah, it's kind of like X, a little Z-ish. Not exactly sure. I'm just gonna fuck with it for an hour, and then it'll come to me as I go. That's a. It's almost like a new level of governance. It's almost like a sixth domain. He's talking about. Um, what's a way to describe that? It's like. Uh, playing. It's like playing a game until you see the outcome. I don't know how you describe it, but yeah. like you may yeah. know. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll maybe we'll articulate to you. Yep. You know, Mike, I'd really love it so that when somebody did this, this happened, right? Yep. That's all I can say. Yep. I can't give you any functional requirements like it must happen every hour, like it must happen this way. Most of the time, those are the requirements you get. Yeah. Right. I need I need to be I need yeah. this to happen, right? Yep. So I'm looking at I'm looking at functional requirements from the outcome perspective. <laughs> I need this to happen. I don't really care how it happens. I just need it to happen. Well, that's not functional requirements. That's a functional outcome. So if I say, oh, you want this to happen? Okay, cool. Give me an hour. Well, I'm going to go back and I have these whole set of tools I know. Yep. I'm going to think, well, which tool is the best for this job? I end up, by default, creating the functional requirements by virtue of how I build that thing. I don't know. It's not. Well, I gotta think about this one because. Well, here's the thing. Like I think in the, in the case of, of of the tool sets that are available, say we talk about Zapier, we talk about Airtable, and all these things. There's not a lot of risk in terms of learning to build and trying things out, seeing how they're gonna work, and the light bulb goes on, and all of a sudden you've got perhaps a tool that is replaced could could in place of spending thirty to forty thousand dollars on something, you've just built a fit for purpose solution that works maybe better than anything else by using a, a some sort of, you know, an air table or a zapier or any sort of things. But this is the, and it's good enough for what a small organization needs. And and you you may not have that functional spec. It may be sort of it's like painting a picture as opposed to trying to build a, a dollhouse where you need a list of instructions. It's like a Lego set, right? You're, you're, you're able to paint a picture and you've got to learn what's working and what looks good and what's acceptable and consumable. And that when you're sometimes development in some of these systems is more of an art than a science. Okay. You take two different approaches with those things, I think. But now we're back to the hammer and the nail dilemma, which is... But suppose I build uh, something for you to solve this problem over here, right? Yeah. And then someone else can go over here and says, you know, I have a problem. And I'm like, well, shit, I just built it. Yep. But I need to make some small changes to it. Is it an advantage to go ahead and use something I already built, make a modified for this person? Yep. Or should I start from the beginning again and objectively reassess all the tools again? Yeah, you, you can, you can, if you've, and with that more, when you've got like a problem, like an air table or, a smart sheet or whatever type tool, you can just say, or, or lucid track. Another example, right? Is I've already built this for another group or, or something like it. Yeah. Demo it. So say, okay, this is what we already built. It took us three weeks to build this, or two weeks, or a day, or whatever it was. And if we just tweak this a little bit, it may not be everything that you want. No, but it'll get you some of the way there. 
I, I 100% agree with you, but this is a circular reference. It's bringing you back to the hammer and the nail issue, which is yeah. if, if I see if I build something and I see it solves a problem, I'm going to try and find and fit every other problem into that same model, as opposed to starting back at square right, one with your, every problem. Your, your, your eyes and looking at other things. But, but there's, there's, it's, it's, it's inefficient to do that, though. It's inefficient to say, oh, no, no, even though I have a solution, let's restart. I'm going to start back at the beginning. That's fucking inefficient. I'm going to do what you just did. You know, to the bathroom listening to music? Lighty. Lighty, baby. I'll be right back. All right. I'm going to just entertain people. I'm actually going to take a note. So stare at this abstract painting behind me for a moment. I mean, I'm making a note for my new book that I just thought of. So I will, I will tell you a story, actually. I've made my note. Here's a story that you may not know. In 1973, Bill Conti, who was a pretty well-known um, musician, wrote an opera. And the opera did an Italian opera. It did mildly okay. Um, as far as operas in 1973 went. But Bill Conti, three years later, in 1976, was asked to put together the score for the, the Rocky soundtrack, the first Rocky movie. And what, what he did was, you know, he thought about what am I going to do to sort of illustrate the like this movie about this this hard knocks boxer and he went back to this opera that he wrote in 1973 he took a portion of it and he reused it in a slightly sped up format in the 1976 original version of Rocky and let me tell you this if you go back and listen to the original Bill Conti 1973 version of this opera and then you compare it to what he evolved it into in the 1976 version of Rocky, the original movie, your mind will be blown. And the reason I'm telling you this is because, let's say you have an idea, and I got just tons of ideas. Most of them I think are probably, at their inception, shit. Uh, they're dog shit ideas. So I look at them and I lay them down on my phone, and I'm like, that's so dumb. But I keep them. I keep every, every note I ever think about. Every note I write. Because, and this is, this is the reason why, because what will happen eventually, I feel, is that every note will come back. And, and a perfect example, last week we were talking about war gaming. I wrote some stuff about it 11 years ago. And it's now worthwhile. Maybe it was worthwhile back then, but it wasn't so much as it is today. And so um, I, I was relating to them, or anybody that watches this, an interesting story yeah. about um, tracking what you know so that you can potentially use it later. And the story I related to them was Bill Conti. Bill Conti wrote a small, unknown Italian opera in 1973. Exactly. Yep. Then he took part of it for the 1976 theme song for Rocky. Yep. And it became, you know, obviously what it is today. But he just had this thing. It didn't do so well. He had an idea. It was like a fragment of a song. Going the Distance is my favorite song from that. And that, he that resurrected it in a new format, but never let the idea die. So if yep. you have an idea, you might be like, this is so stupid. It's not. Take it from Bill Conti. It is not dumb. Just write it down. Store it. Once you do that, you'll know you have it. And you need one of the songs playing on the background while you're doing the speech. 
Training the hard now. Yeah. You know, it's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite stories because uh, he was he was Bill Conti was like uh, trying to make his mark in the world and tried a whole bunch of stuff, including this essential small Italian opera, which would someday become one of the most recognized theme songs in all time. No. Amazing. There you have it. Uh, there's my story on save everything. Save a complete digital hoarder. A, why not? Because we have plenty of space. But B, because your ideas. You don't know. It's good to stick with your most, ideas. Believe most, of my, most of my books are written off of scraps of things I've kept over the years. I have a black book. I have a green book. I have sticky notes everywhere. I have Google Keep Notes. And they're just all things I'm like, driving down the road. I'm like, oh, shit. I should think of this. And I have no idea why I wrote, I wrote it. I just think of it. I go to Google Keep, make a voice recording. I have it. Oh, you, you do some voice recording too. Sometimes all the time. Oh, yeah. Google Keep. Nice. I have hundreds, hundreds of voice notes. As soon as it comes to my brain, I'm like, tunnel vision. What is it about? Who talks about it? How does it affect war gaming? Record that. Record that. And Record then I get home and I'm like, Tunnel vision. It reminds me of that Seinfeld episode, and a lot of things remind me of Seinfeld episodes where Jerry's sleeping, he wakes up in the middle of the night, he writes down a joke he thinks of. Yep. He wakes up in the morning, he can't understand what he wrote. A lot of my notes are like, what the fuck is, what, what is this even what mean? Are I, what is I even talking about? <laughs> but then I, it comes back to me. Um, and the last, so anyway, welcome back to the bathroom. Any good music? What's that? Any good music in the bathroom? No, not really. Okay. No Phil Collins? No Easy Lover. No it's the Studio? No it's the Studio. What do you think about that song, Mike? What do you think about the Studio? Do you think you just gave up? I think it was like a hit a record contract. I don't know. It was the number one hit. the Studio. Wasn't that his dog's name? Well, it was I think a it number was. one hit in a, in a time of just all bullshit number one hits. Should we look at what the number one hits were at that time? I think they were all by him. <laughs> No, Michael Jackson was huge. Huey Lewis in the news. Um, David Bowie had a few number one hits, right? You just can't start Jeremy. naming. You can't start naming artists that all had number one hits. I'm thinking about at that time. Oh, at that time. You're just you're just reciting artists now for MTV. No, I'm just, number one hits in the eighties. So, by the way, I've done some I've done some conclusive evidence. I got I've I've done some research. Like our friend over at InfoWorld. Okay. Um, mine substantiated that <laughs> a couple things. If you listen to all Phil Collins' songs after In the Air Tonight, they are all, I'm talking about read the lyrics, folks, they are all uh, admissions of guilt. Okay? Admissions of guilt. Yes. Okay. I can cite literal lyrics for you. Okay, but go ahead. My bigger question, Mike, is after he killed this guy, do you think that Genesis kicked him out of the band permanently because of this? Genesis didn't kick him out of the band. Do you think that Genesis was involved in the murder? There was no murder. There's no murder. So you're you're technically an accomplice, but you don't think Genesis kicked him out because he did it? Genesis didn't kick him out. You mean in the 90s? Why did Genesis, why did Phil Collins go off on his own? What, in the late 90s? No, in the 80s. He didn't. He All did. the songs he did were by himself. No, he did a bunch of songs with Genesis in the 90s. It's all a cover-up. No, I'm telling you, he was, he was in Genesis until 95. 1995 or 96. So they would have you believe. We Can't Dance? You hear that out? You heard that album, right? I can't dance. I can't talk. So I always thought that was a commercial for beer. That's a real song. It is. <laughs> That's one of the worst songs. One of the worst songs. That's a I terrible can't. song. We should play should that. We down, no, should we go down a list of all the worst Phil Collins songs? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Here we go. It should be easy. I'll just list all Phil Collins songs. All right. Except for In the Air Tonight. In the Air Tonight's great. Phil Collins songs. Okay, here we go. I'm going to rank these on a scale of 1 to 10. All right, go ahead. 
Where 10 is awesome and 1 is shit. Okay. In the air tonight, 10. Okay. You'll be in my heart. You'll be in my heart. 1. Against all odds. 2. Really? Easy lover. 1. Another day in paradise. 3. A gooby kind of love. Oh, that's a cover. Yeah. Um, You've that a one? One. Okay. Take me home. Ten. That's a ten. That song's amazing. I wish it would rain wait, down. No, no, wait. I wish it would rain down. What do you think? Ten being the worst or the best? Best. Yeah. Take me home. Awesome. I wish it would rain down. Yep. That's a five. That's a two. Really? I, I don't care that's anymore. That's a ten. And by the way, I don't care anymore. It came out. I don't care anymore. It's a ten. After in the air tonight. Which, which basically, he was like, I don't care anymore about that guy. <laughs> that's what he said. That's before. a one. I don't care anymore. He's fucking dead in the water. I think it's, it, you can, yeah, you play backwards. So you think that's a sequel? Play backwards. That's a sequel? It's so a studio. That's a negative 15. I think we should play it instrumentally I, for you. I, I can't dance. Negative 20. That's Genesis. Land of Confusion. That's Genesis. Three. You don't think? I think that's a good one. Invisible Touch. Mm. Invisible Touch is a three. Three point one. Land of Confusion is like an eight. Separate Lives. What? Oh boy. One. Uh, Some White Knights the al album. Yeah, okay. that's that's Stephen Bishop. Um, that's all. That's good. I give that an eight. It's a good. No, it's a one. It's a country song. Come on, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> What about Man on the Corner? Have you heard that song? In Too Deep? That's good. I like that song, too. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's... That's, that's, it, that's it, Genesis. It's also another reflection on the guy drowning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. Dude, it's all over the place. It's, oh, I can't even hide it. Okay, here's the Rolling Stone... Ten best Phil Collins songs. Ready? Oh, really? Oh, boy. This is Rolling Stone. Number ten, The Roof is Leaking. Never heard it. That's great. Let's skip that one. That's a good song. No, it's not. Yes, it number is. Number nine, Don't Lose My Number. Are you fucking kidding I'm me? Not, that's not, I'm not a huge fan of that. Ricky? Billy, Don't You Lose My or Number? Billy. 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 Ricky or Billy? Billy. Billy. Who's Billy? I don't know. I think he just got you kill. Probably. I Wish It Would Rain Down. Number eight. Who the fuck? It's the studio number seven. Oh my god. The rather bizarre name the studio come from came out of Phil Collins' mouth one day while he improvising next to the drum machine. Yeah, it's all made I up. I kind of knew I had to find something else for the word. I then went back and tried to find another word that scanned as well as the studio and couldn't find one. And thus the world met a girl named the studio. He just made it up. Another day in paradise is six. He wrote the track after walking around D.C. and seeing hordes of people living in boxes. Look how pernicious. <laughs> Take Me Home. Take Me Home is my favorite. Many people think it's about a weary traveler. In truth, the song is about a mental patient yearning to be set free from an institution. Inspired by one from the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> Come on! That's e awesome! Easy Lover? You don't like Easy Lover? They know. Check out the uh, See, Phil, Phil's a amazing, Phil amazing sweater vest in the goofy video. Did he have a swest? A swest. Number three, I don't care anymore. I thought you'd like that song. Number two, Against All Odds. Yep. The soundtrack 1984 Jeff Bridges movie Against All Odds is like a mini Genesis reunion. Peter Gabriel contributed the track Walk Through Fire. Mike Rutherford made a song making a big mistake. And no he actually can... sang on, which was interesting. Yeah. And then it was number good. one. Number one. In the air tonight. In the air tonight. Despite all the success, it remains the most famous work of his career, detailing the murder of his best friend in the canoe. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, it's right here. It's on the internet. Let me see that. That's not what it says. It's, uh, I already closed it. Sorry. You already closed it. Yep. 
Poor yeah. Phil. He's only sold up 160 million records. He's, he had it so rough. Listen, rich people feel entitled to do that stuff. Yeah. What, wasn't there that uh, football player who, like, um, I don't know, killed somebody? Oh, yeah, there's been a few of those. <laughs> oh, well, that's what I heard. That's the same point. Uh, yeah, there, was a, there was a guy who killed somebody. He hit his car. Football player. Oh, yeah, there's plenty of people who have killed other people. What do you think? I just don't think that song's about that, but that's all right. I agree to disagree. So, by the way, this is funny. I used, uh, I told you, I, I was using AI on Buzzsprout to generate the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the track the audio for, track. The for um, in the track for our podcast. Yep. It devoted a whole section to Phil Collins. <laughs> I had to cut it out. What's your what's your top ten Peter Gabriel songs? Are those? Would you say that more more or less in, in your eyes? Yeah. Salisbury Hill. Yeah. So those are you'd say those are ones. The tens. Tens is in the best. Yeah. Got it. And uh, Red Rain. Red Rain is a ten. It's a nine. A nine. That's it. That's it. No other songs. No. Come to mind. Shock the Monkey is a negative five. Shock the Monkey is pretty rough. Yeah. I listened to his new album. Well, it played on XR Media while I was driving. I like the new album. And uh, well, it sounded but... like Dave Gahan or somebody. Dave who? Gahan from... Uh, oh. Not from NXS, from uh, Depeche Mode. You know I've been listening to a lot is... Uh, um, dire Straits. Are you a fan of them or no? Well, my friend, you know Murphy. Yeah, I know Murphy. Yeah, he went through a huge Dire Straits phase. Yeah, so they were the greatest ever. Then switched to Beach Boys after that. I tried to listen to. I mean, Mark Knopfler's good. Mark Knopfler and Emily Harris. That album. Beach oh Boy, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yep. But I am not a Dire Straits fan only because I don't like it. You don't like it? Nope. That's okay. I've been listening to a lot of. Um, You're a state of trance fan. I'm a. I will always and forever be a fan of trance. 1998 to 2002. I listened to. Except like, for Scooter. Scooter was uh, German techno. You think Scooter would be on our podcast? We could have him. Oh my god! I mean, my dream. Yeah, but I listen to a lot of trap. Trap, trap, trap. Yeah. Like Twenty One Savage. Yep. Young Jeezy. Uh, do you listen to stuff while you run, or you just you can't you can't you just have to? It all depends. If it's a really really long run, yeah. Uh, I have a couple playlists that are very very long. Yep. So I have variety. Yep. Um, mostly heavy metal, like very heavy metal. Oh really? I had no idea. What type of heavy heavy metal do you listen to? Uh, anywhere between black metal and and just regular heavy metal. So I like a lot of Sepultura, Slayer. Um, I listen a little Iron Maiden. So the 19, 1985 Right After Death album is one of the best heavy metal albums of all time. Love Ozzy, early Ozzy, early Black Sabbath. Gotcha. Uh, Biohazard, Anthrax. Uh, also a lot of 80s metal. So it's kind of like the biggest playlist I have. Very cool. And you can actually run to it. There's like Biohazard and stuff. Yeah, I bet it drives. Oh my god, crazy. Like Motley Crue, drives. anything Motley Crue, you're, just, you're sprinting. Um, I don't listen to trance so much when I run, but I do listen to it in the office all the time. And the, trance and Yacht Rock. Yacht Rock, okay. I'm a huge Yacht Rock fan. Yacht Rock is good. Yacht Rock and 70s on 7 are the two channels I jam the most out of my office. On you should listen to watercolors. Watercolors. I know you told me about that. You know, I've heard you've heard Betty Mardonis four times a day. And... <laughs> <laughs> Dan Fogelberg. That's the way to do it. Yep. And uh, who's the saxophonist? Uh, Kenny. Kenny. No, Sergio Mendez. Sergio. Not Kenny G. Kenny G was 90. Right? Kenny G. No, there was a lot of great, great, great music put out in the 70s that people just kind of ignored because it wasn't disco. And the Yacht Rock guy 
it's hysterical because he's like, I'm getting my smooth on today. Gotta love it. Gotta get my shoes right. right. Well, what do you say, man? How are we doing? I, uh, what do I say? I say, don't be a dick. Yeah. I got passed on 117 yesterday morning. By a guy. It's at 5.45 in the morning. I'm just doing 35 minutes, 30, chilling, having my coffee. This Volvo, this gold Volvo SUV gets up on my ass. I'm not going fast, apparently. It goes around me. On 117, no passing lanes. Then there's a car pulls out. Gets behind this guy, delegates him, goes around him. And then he gets a little further down 117. And meanwhile, on 5.45 in the morning, if you're not on your way to the construction site, you're kind of fucked. Yep. And this guy encounters four cars on 117. Now, we're in Lincoln at this point. Goes around all of them on a blind curve. Wow. Ends up cutting everybody off, including an oncoming biker. I don't know how he didn't kill them all. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a perfect guy that should be on our Don't Be a Dick segment of this podcast. Yes. yes Absolutely. You're late because you're, you, you overdid it last night and you slept in or you didn't miss your alarm. Yep. Don't make the rest of us nearly die because you're delinquent on, on exactly. uh, driving. So don't be a dick. Do not be a dick. Park West Wagmore. Uh, be nice to old people. They need, they need your help. Don't. If someone's used to hey, hold the door open for them. If someone's carrying a bunch of heavy shit into the FedEx office, ask them if they need help. Yeah, hold the door open. Let them say no. Just be a nice person. It's better. I feel better when I'm nice. It's okay to be nice. Everyone, if you liked this podcast right. episode, give us a thousand stars. A thousand Spend them out over all the things. Um... Frozen Tell Twinkies. your friends. Next week, we're going to be somewhere either in the barn or new. <laughs> <laughs> then we, here we are at Benny Hanna's. No, we're at the Benigan's. 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 Benigan's, sorry. We're at the local. We're at the House of Blues. The House of Blues. Right now. Right now. We'll be somewhere else next week. And uh, next week, we're going to continue governance. We have the last two domains. Security included. Uh oh. Watch one. out. We should, we should get Litterer back on. Give it, give us his take on it. That would be great. Then we get to get out. Then we're done with governance after next week. And next week will yep. be a relatively short read too. And then um, next week will be episode twenty-five. By the way, unreal. Like, think about how many things do you own or twenty-five? Twenty-five episodes. Yeah. Every a couple of them. friends bought t-shirts I was, I was told a, a friend bought a t-shirt okay a friend okay one we need more friends to buy t-shirts yes because that is money we do give us five stars